We're going to start in just a minute or two, so if folks could come in and take a seat, that would be great. There's still a couple people flowing in. We'll let them get their seats. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to M Health Connect version 2.0. My name's Scott Delp. I'm one of the hosts of the meeting together with Ida Sims from the UC San Francisco. The goal of this symposium over the next half day and then whole day tomorrow is to improve the use of physical activity wearables and apps for clinical purposes, to really bring them to research and medical applications by bringing together device and app developers with clinicians and medical researchers so that we can address the key barriers to that issue. For example, at last year's meeting, we formed a team, uh, academic industry team, that's focused on practical issues related to validation and accuracy testing. In many research and clinical applications, we need to have particular accuracy standards, and we're setting out a program for addressing those. The M Health Connect event is brought to you by two NIH National Centers of Excellence in Big Data. And one of them is the Mobilize Center. I lead the Mobilize Center. And the Mobilize Center's goal is to improve human health and well being through uh, physical activity and to address the limitations of physical activity brought about by uh, a variety of conditions osteoarthritis, stroke, cerebral palsy, obesity, and other health problems. In general, the center brings together people who have backgrounds in data science and biomechanics and public health and medical applications. And I've highlighted four of the folks who uh, spoke at last year's conference. But the Mobilize Center really represents over 30 people, graduate students, uh, even a couple undergrads, postdocs, staff, and faculty members all dedicated to addressing this problem. The second center is based at uh, University of Memphis, but includes uh, investigators from over 15 institutions, MD2K. And they're taking the basic stance of trying to figure out how to gain insight from uh, raw data and wearable sensors. And they're driven by two key application areas, smoking cessation and congestive heart failure. Ida Sims is here from the MD2K Center, and we'll, uh, you'll learn more of that, about that from Ida uh, coming up. So the plan for today is to begin with a scientific session where we have an outstanding lineup of speakers. You'll hear more about that in just a minute. We'll take a quick break after the speakers, and then we'll have a, a panel up here that I think will be a very lively panel. I encourage you all to contribute and participate in that panel. Last year's discussions were really excellent, and I believe this year will be as well. There'll be a set of lightning talks to introduce you to the posters that we have. We had planned an outdoor poster session, beer garden thing, but uh, you know the terrible California weather has uh, put that inside. It's actually there's a beautiful set of posters set up across the way, and so we'll go uh, across the way and have a reception and posters over there. So I wanted to, uh, before introducing Ida, just thank Ida and Joy Koo for organizing this event and Diane and Sharon, who are not here because they're outside uh, trying to make everything work. They've done an incredible amount of work to make this smooth, and when you get a chance to thank them, please do. So with that, I want to bring uh, Ida up. She's going to uh, introduce the session, tell you what's uh, coming up. Ida's a professor in medicine at UC San Francisco. I'll leave the agenda. Great. Thank you, Scott, and let me add my welcome uh, also to this event on behalf of the MD2K Center. Um, we uh, intended for this afternoon's session to 
set the uh, context for discussion about how to bring wearables into clinical care and research. And to that end, we have a spectrum of speakers that you'll be hearing from. I have the privilege of introducing David Shaywitz, who will be our moderator, and reflecting on the broad perspectives that we need to bring together to address these issues. David, I think, is a, a perfect person for doing that. He's uh, the chief medical officer of DA Nexus and has over 10 years of industry experience. Also has an academic background. Uh, he's visiting scientist uh, for biomedical informatics at Harvard and is a physician and an endocrinology specialist. And as you uh, may well know, he's also a commentator on Forbes. So I think he really brings that sort of broad perspective um, and uh, to stimulate some discussion, both from our panelists and from you as well. So without further ado, David, uh, take it away. Thanks. Works. All righty. All righty. Well, it's great to be uh, back here. Um, uh, last year was my first year doing this conference, and I, I came away just really struck. It was one of the uh, the most interesting and grounded and thoughtful conferences I've had that is at the interface of health and technology. And it was really exciting to be among a, a group of colleagues who are both manage to keep in their brains just these two distinct concepts of being amazingly excited by the promise of the technology, but also really grounded in, in, in scientific rigor and really determined to make sure that the technology lives up to its uh, much advertised promise. So um, I just wanted to set the context for a little bit. Uh, if you were to look at sort of the big picture of healthcare, the, um, you know, everyone's griping about what's wrong with healthcare, but if you had to break it down into sort of a couple of different criteria, you'd say it's that we tend to be reactive uh, versus anticipatory. We provide care in an episodic way within the four walls of a hospital rather than in a continuous fashion. We uh, do it, we, we act as if everyone's an average patient rather than customizing care to each individual, more, uh, at least more often than we should. Uh, we rely on precedent rather than continuous feedback. And we tend to, um, even in clinical studies, often view the patient as the recipient rather than the patient as, uh, as driver, patient as participant. To, to be successful, we really need to leverage both the genomic and the digital revolutions and to learn how to intelligently integrate uh, the advances of each. Um, uh, my day job, I, uh, you know, at DNA Nexus, we really focus, I think, in a remarkably excellent way on the genomic re rev uh, revolution, on really um, the, the analysis and management of, of large-scale uh, genomic data in a secure and compliant way, and that's not the focus of today. What we're really going to talk about is uh, digital, digital health. Digital health, uh, Danny and I have been thinking about this for, at, at MassGenome for a while, and um, at one point we decided that, um, or characterized it as digital health is, um, and is enabled by sensors and other mHealth tools, provides a way for medicine to break out of its traditional constraints of time and place, to understand patients in a way they really experience life and health, in a way that's episodic, not, uh, continuous, not episodic, and it strives to offer care in, in an anticipatory or uh, timely fashion. And at the essence of this really is phenotype and the opportunity to, dent, to understand uh, dense phenotype at scale. And this is really some of the opportunities that the wearables and other apps that we're talking about today really provide. This is also a key aspiration of the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative. Uh, this this uh, slide is from one of the, the presentations associated with that. So um, we're almost done here. The aspiration, this is where I wanted to get at, the aspiration of a lot of all of this data is well, my gosh, we, coll we collect the genetics and then the sensors and EMR, and somehow we stick it in a big vat O data, we stir it around, and phew, insight shows up. Um, um, and I'm not really sure that's really been our, the universal experience to date. Um, outside the, the bubble of true believers, and this next image is courtesy of Jeff Reed, I, I suspect the image is more like this, is more, is more like this um, with Grumpy Cat. Um, where, uh, you know, people try to disrupt health care and, you know, it, it's still a work in progress. And, and I think a, kind of a, a more nuanced view is we're probably somewhere in between insight and grumpy cat, where there's a real opportunity that all of us here, we're all here, we're all motivated, we're driven because we see when we recognize 
this exceptional potential, but we also recognize that, that we're not there yet. As an example of some of the challenges, just last year, Chris Anderson, as some of you may know, one of the um, uh, original editors of Wired, he um, kind of uh, traumatized folks on Twitter where he, um, he was an initial champion of the quantified self, and then he, um, a big enthusiast, and then he, he tweeted, after many years of self-tracking um, everything from activity, work, and sleep, I have uh, decided it's basically pointless. No non-obvious lessons or incentives. Unhappy face. Emoticon, so his version of the grumpy cat. Um, and so I, what I'm really um, hoping we can do today is the last slide uh, before I introduce the first speaker, Michael, um, is to um, really take a grounded view of the opportunities and the challenges of capturing the value, capturing and reflecting the value of phenotypic data. I want us to be really mindful of, of, of real opportunities and see what might be working and not to be cynical, not to be sort of reflexively nihilistic, but at the same time to look for red flags, to look to make sure that we don't just um, sort of suffer, I guess, what Nassim Taleb calls neomania and thinking something is amazing and cool just because it's new and shiny. Um, we're really blessed today with some real experts, insanely blessed today. I, I don't know how you, I really have no idea how you did it. Um, but I've gotten incredibly great expert perspectives from, from really four critical domains. From, and, and I feel bad for the first one because I put Michael Snyder from Stanford in quantified self, but he could have been in, in any number of buckets. But um, uh, as, as a professor at Stanford and as a real leader in so many areas, a professor of genetics in so many other areas, um, but kind of probably best known for, for really his championing of the quantified self efforts. Um, we have a drug development represented um, uh, with sort of the VP and global head of development at Teva, uh, Spiros. Um, we have medical centers with Laura Wilt from Oshner and um, uh, device makers um, with uh, Cedric Hutchings, now at Nokia, but also the, uh, the original CEO, uh, one of the CEOs and founder of um, Wythings. So with that, let me introduce and welcome our first speaker from, from right five minutes away, um, <laughs> Michael Snyder, a professor of genetics at Stanford. Okay, well, thanks very much for having me here. Let's see, I don't we'll see issue number one in technology. I'm a Mac guy, so we will. And I'm told my presentation is here. Is that correct? Bottom left. Oh, there I am. Number two. Okay, great, thank you. All right, well, it is a pleasure to be here. I have, was not here last year, and I'm delighted to be able to attend this one. I, I think it's a testament to the field and its excitement that there's actually a related conference going on, I don't know if you're aware, called System X, with a different flair, but it's going on in the medical school, also in the idea of sensing and detection. So. The fact that you have two of these conferences in the same day, I think, says there's just an incredible amount of activity here. So I'm going to tell you about uh, some of our experience using wearables and uh, what we're trying to do to uh, see what we can learn and, and bring into this arena about health and, the, and its detection. But I first want to frame this in general terms, at least how we like to think about things. So we like to view health as a state and that Hopefully most of the time you are in the healthy state, but there will be times when you will not be healthy and you'll transition into a, a disease state. And it's obviously influenced by many things, your genome and then lots of other things. Uh, we like to collectively call your exposome, all the various exposures. And I would argue that this area is just starting to get under control. There's so much, much more to do, but I do believe we will be in a world where people will get their genome sequence before they're born. Uh, but then here's an area that we're not so great at capturing. This, is, it seems to me, is where a lot of M Health can really have enormous impact or potential uh, for being able to make all kinds of interesting measurements. And if nothing else, we should be able to detect some of the effects of these. Even if we can't detect them directly, we should be able to detect their effects, for example, pathogens, on health states. And so the ultimate goal will be to try and use all this information to be able to better manage people's health. So we've started a project, again, just to put this in context, a number of years ago, it's actually seven years ago now, where we're trying to collect 
lots and lots of data about people while they're healthy and trying to understand in incredible detail what it means to be healthy and then what happens when people transition to disease state. So we actually do sequence people's DNA uh, and then we measure actually their modified DNA. It's something, an area called epigenomics and epigenetics. And we may measure all their RNA, muscles out of blood, proteins as much as we can, cytokines, uh, their, their lipids and metabolites. We measure this both in blood and, and in urine. And so we're basically literally doing deep sampling on people and then making billions of measurements. You may have heard about the microbiome. That's a very exciting area that also manages people's health. And so, again, we're trying to make these measurements when people are healthy, define their personal health state. It's all done at a personal level. And then understand what happens when they trigger into a disease state through a viral infection or other sorts of things. Uh, and so this is how the project started. And then about three years ago, a little bit more than that now, we started entering the world of biosensors. We certainly like this idea because you can make continuous measurements, as you heard already from David, and be able to... Uh, collect data on a continuous basis and, and see what we might learn. What I liked about these is very complementary sets of data. This is more physiological measurements as we're measuring it. There are some biochemical ones. And then we can try and integrate it with these other sort of molecular measurements, again, to better define people's health state. So about three years ago, we decided to enter this space. And um, many of you may have entered before then, I'm not sure, but I remember in the summer of 2015, after we were in this, we just did a census and there was something like 500 wearable or portable devices on the market that were measuring some health-related aspect or physiology. So it's a pretty daunting set of things. And certainly when we started, we basically started evaluating these both for accuracy. I wasn't going to talk a whole lot about that, but we can talk from the panel. But a big issue for us was just figuring out how to get access to the data as a researcher. We can, yes, we can sign people for these studies, but who would work with us to get us the data? Um, and that actually wasn't so trivial. Now it's a little bit easier, but back then it's very hard to find someone who would work with us to get this. So anyway, we, we ultimately did settle on, uh, we evaluated about 30 different devices, settled in on a few, I, well, it's more than a few now, I guess I use nine of these devices every day. I have three smartwatches right now, actually. Um, and we do collect information. And a lot of the data I'll show you is actually from a basis watch, which is interestingly no longer available. But um, anyway, so uh, when we launched this project, again, we started measuring many things. There's a few additional things not on here, like continuous glucose and stress response. But we did use a number of these devices to make many measurements. I think you'll appreciate. You can obviously measure your activity, steps, biking, and so on. You can get some of that just from apps on your iPhone. Uh, but we also had things, uh, virtually all the devices measure heart rate. Uh, we measure blood oxygen using several different devices, skin temperature, uh, sleep we think is very important, so on and so forth. Some of these things are, seem a little strange, like radiation, you might wonder, well, it turns out that turns out to be interesting on occasion too, as you'll, um, well, we can get into that later. But the bottom line is you can make all kinds of very interesting health-related measurements, uh, and most of them do relay the information into your smartphone. So the first step was to try and define people's personal patterns because the ultimate goal, as we see it, for defining health is to try and find deviations from people's baseline health state. So basically, we started collecting information, again, about people's patterns, and this happens to be my pattern, is my sleep, heart rate, skin temperature. And not surprisingly, I sleep at night, um, and I'm awake during the day with an occasional nap in there. Uh, here's my heart rate, you know, low at night, higher during the day. Skin temperature, high at night. This is different from core temperature. Skin temperature high, low during the day, comes uh, back up at night, and so on. So you can define people's personal baseline numbers. That's me. This is now the data from 45 people. Everybody, it turns out, has a different baseline resting heart rate, whether it's nighttime or daytime. They are a bit different. Uh, we all have personal baseline skin temperature differences, and we all have personal baseline oxygen differences as well. So everybody's different. And to me, this is one of the powers of these devices in that they are collecting data at a personal level. Uh, and then you can do things with these data. Uh, you can start grouping people into different patterns if you like. So this is some of the fun stuff you can consider. So this is grouping people into four types of pattern. Uh, I should point out that um, a lot of this work was done by Xiao Li, Jesse Dunn, who's giving a poster here, so you can learn more and speak with her later, and also Dennis Salins, as well as others. 
And so this was basically four activity patterns people tend to have. So this was one where people are generally constant during the day, so not very active at night. Uh, constant activity during the day back down at night. So you know, even if you're not very active, you'd probably fall into this pattern. These are morning people. They spike in the morning. These are people who are active in the morning and afternoon, and these are people who are active morning, afternoon, and evening, so on. So you can start grouping people by their baseline differences. No surprises there. Well, the key then for health, in my opinion, is to try and find deviations from your personal baseline. So as we started measuring more and more people, this is one of the things that came up. This is known already. It turns out on airline flights, um, if you go up in an airplane, um, this is altitude in green. This is one particular flight. Uh, your, your altitude is there. Oxygen, your blood oxygen will actually drop. So it's here, it goes down. They pressurize airplanes at 8,000 feet. Uh, your blood oxygen drops and comes back up. And by the way, there's an app on your iPhone that actually measures air pressure, and you can get that directly on these flights. Uh, we didn't have this at the time. Whoops, got ahead of ourselves. Uh, what wasn't so well documented, as far as I could tell, is how much and how often it drops. Well, it turns out, for me, it drops into 96% or below on about 70% of the time on flights. And about 5% of the time, it goes 90 or below, which is actually fairly low. Okay, so um, those happen to be my personal measurements. It turns out this is not just true for me. This is true for... Everybody, I guarantee, we've looked at lots of people and lots of different ethnic groups. If you go on an airplane and it goes above 30,000 feet, it's up there for any prolonged period of time, your oxygen will drop. So green is ground, blue is uh, cruising altitude, and every single person, every single flight, your oxygen drops if it's high enough and it's long enough. Okay, so what wasn't necessarily known, as far as I could tell in the literature, is that when your oxygen drops, you get tired. It's correlated with tiredness. So for me, that number is 96, meaning um, you can do a blind test where you classify yourself as tired or alert and then look at your oxygen. And so this is on the ground, this is an airplane, but blue means I'm tired, uh, red means I'm alert. 96 is roughly the threshold. So 96 or lower, tired, 96 or higher, I'm alert. We can do this more quantitatively. You can do reaction time tests meaning you can um, uh, see how quickly you respond to a visual cue. And this is percent oxygen, reaction time. Your response time gets slower as your oxygen drops. Okay, so the bottom line is on airline flights, you go up in an airplane, your oxygen drops, and it's very tightly correlated with being tired. Okay, I don't think that's so surprising, but it hasn't really been documented. So Next time you're on your airline flight and you're feeling tired, it's probably not because you've been working too hard. It's probably because the oxygen has dropped. Now, for those of you who are workaholics like me, that's very disappointing news, but there's hope. If the flight is long enough, you'll actually adapt. And so for me, that number is seven hours. We've done this now quite a few times. This is one example here. So it starts out, oxygen drops, I napped a little, it will drop low during a nap. But after seven hours, it's pretty near every time, it will come back up. All right. So uh, these are all to define personal baselines and what happens during very specific perturbations. Turns out airline flights is a very interesting perturbation uh, and you can find then again deviations from this. So to me this is the power of finding uh, unhealthy states. So on one particular flight, this is a personal example, I was flying to Norway and it turns out my oxygen was much, much lower than usual. So I should preface this by saying I was in rural Massachusetts for two weeks, helping my brother put up fences where 55% of ticks are Lyme infested. And then two weeks later, I fly to Norway uh, and fly to Frankfurt, and then from Frankfurt to Oslo. And on a short flight like that, that should be what my normal oxygen looks like based on many flights. And I measure myself all the time, so I know what it looks like. Uh, on this flight, the median and mean oxygen was 90, and when I landed, it would, did, not, did not come back to normal. Moreover, my heart rate was much higher. This is a two-year pattern, but you look at fraction of outlying measurements. This is heart rate, this is skin temperature, and there are many, many more outlying measurements of heart rate uh, when I landed, uh, and it was very obvious. And later I learned my skin temperature is elevated as well. It can, that down here. And so the bottom line is um, that turned out to be very valuable for me because, uh, in fact, 
Um, so I had these abnormal measurements. I then got a low-grade fever, went to a doctor in Norway who uh, pulled my blood, said, you have high monocytes, it's bacterial. I think you should take penicillin. And I said, no, I think I should take doxycycline, which is what you use for Lyme disease. Uh, it was very tense for a moment there, as you might imagine. Uh, and he actually did give in. I have my wife there as my witness, and she speaks Norwegian, so there was no miscommunication here. Uh, and the net result was, in fact, um, he gave me doxycycline, he gave in. And then I, when I came back, I gave blood, and sure enough, I was Lyme positive, and I have the perfect control. I was Lyme negative when I had left. I'd given a sample just before I left. So the bottom line is, these measurements, and this is a personal example, were actually very valuable for finding the first signs of detection. So the question is, how can this be generalized? And so uh, we've actually looked at this now for every time I've gotten sick. What's nice about our cohort is we have lots and lots of measurements, including measurements of something called CRP, C-reactive protein, which is an indicator when you're ill. And so for the first two years while I was wearing these devices, we can pour over the data. And sure enough, there were four periods where I'd ha had outlying measurements of heart rate and skin temperature. One is the Lyme disease case. You can't miss that. Those, measure, those values are so high off scale. Those are, as I say, they're unmissable uh, in terms of a fraction of outlier measurements. So that's each day there. Uh, this is a day I had a cold. That's a day I had a cold. Those also give outlying measurements. And most days are right down in here. Uh, it turns out um, there was another day where I didn't report being sick, but actually had, that's this one here, high heart rate, uh, sorry, high heart rate, high skin temperature, and then I went back and looked at the CRP, and in fact, that was elevated, it's just as high as when I had a viral infection. So the bottom line is every single time I have a high viral, I, I have um, high CRP, I actually have high heart rate and oxygen, and so you can detect this with wearables, and so we think it's actually more sensitive than perhaps your perception. So we've written algorithms to look at this more directly. There's a lot to do here. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do now, which is to try and find when people get sick at the very earliest possible times. And so for every one of those times I've gotten sick, in fact, we can, we, we look for a change in heart rate over a defined period with a low false positive rate. And we can actually pick this up, we think, with fairly clear signatures. And you can pick up all four times of my illnesses. We had four illnesses on three other folks and we can pick up theirs as well, each time normalizing to their personal baseline rate. So we actually think there is a lot of potential for these. This is all done relative to resting heart rates. Heart rates is better than skin temperature, it turns out, uh, but there's more improvements to do. We also think, I won't have time to get into this, but we think you can also pick up uh, elevated insulin resistance, which is a precursor to type 2 diabetes with, this, with some of these sorts of measurements. One of those parameters is, in fact, altered heart rate as well, which tends to be up in those who are more insulin resistant. So uh, where is all this going? Well, I think the ultimate goal of many of us is to try to make your smartphone your command center, if you will. Whoops. For this, there's a lot to do to be able to do this to get this data integrated properly. And ultimately, I think, share it with the physician. Uh, this is the world I'd like to see us head towards, where with the genome sequence, we would add molecular information with wearable information to make uh, things more anticipatory. These are some of the challenges ahead. I do, think, um, I do think the devices are fairly accurate overall, but there are some that are not. That's something we talk about. I think it's a matter of defining which health events exactly we think we can, we can detect with low false positives. I think that's a big deal. I think we will need to run proper trials to show the benefits. Nobody believes you unless you run proper trials. Uh, there is some level of regulation needed, and that's higher or lower depending on the particular devices and the particular applications. Um, I think this is the hardest barrier that I see, which is getting physicians to adopt the concept. I don't, how many people are MDs here? Okay, well, I just probably insulted all of you. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's open for discussion. Uh, and of course, I'm not so worried about this, but many people are about data access and privacy. So I do want to say thanks uh, to the folks in my lab who did the work, Xiao Li, Jesse Dunn, again, who has a poster, Dennis, uh, I've led the study and I have wonderful other collaborators as well. There's a shameless plug for a book I have that came out, you're welcome to read it. It even has a chapter on wearables. So do we take questions now or do yeah, we do it at the panel? Yeah. How would you like to we do this? We have two microphones set up and um, for questions, let's thank Michael. For oh, okay. <laughs>
As folks are approaching the microphone, maybe I'll start with the first question. Sure. Zach Kahane always talks about the concept of the incidental element. How do you um, view the problem of not the, not the sensitivity and your ability to detect something when you sort of know it's there, but all the, all the time that there might have been an increased heart rate, and all the, with all, so many things that you're detecting, how do you avoid sort of toxic false positives? Yeah, I would say two things there. One is by adjusting the threshold. That is to say, I think the times when I had Lyme disease, those signals are so much stronger than my common cold ones. So you could deal with that by adjusting the threshold. Yeah, where you, well, you just increase the window where you demand either the number of outlying, outlying heart measurements to be higher or the intensity of those heart measurements. In both cases, they are higher, I believe, uh, with the Lyme disease and the other. So that's one way to do it. The other is, quite frankly, I think it's gonna be common sense. That is to say, if a scary movie gives you a high heart rate, well, you'll know that. You know, your light will go yellow and you'll say, all right, well, it's a scary movie, no big deal. Uh, and where it becomes a bigger issue is when these devices go on someone else. So I think the biggest power of these devices is for like your kids or for taking care of the elderly. And then when the light goes yellow on my kid and I don't know where they're at, I worry they're getting sick and they're just watching some scary movie. Um, you know, I'll probably text them and they'll say, forget it, Dad, You're watching, I'm watching a scary movie. So those are issues I guess we'll have to figure out. I don't want to be at the point where I'm seeing what they're seeing all the time. That's a little too invasive in privacy. But yeah, these are some of the issues. It's a good question, though. Thanks for the talk. Um, so we're trying to. Wait, you want to introduce yourself first for the audience? I'm Donna Sprout Metz. I'm from the University of Southern California, and I direct the USCM Health Collaboratory. Okay. Um, as we, I would really like to move towards more sensitive and specific biomarkers that you're developing at. And right now it's like everything's elevated, so maybe I have any one of these things. How do you see us moving closer to actually knowing what thing we have? Knowing what, what? I, I missed the key word you said in there. Sorry, mm -hmm. it's a little muffled okay, up Okay, sorry. There. So right now you, you have a bunch of biomarkers and a bunch of signals. Right. And when X and Y are elevated, could be anything. Yeah. How do you think, do you think we're gonna be able to move towards more yeah, specific. this is a really good question. I mean, from these kinds of measurements, we're only going to tell you have some sort of inflammatory disease, I think. Uh, I'm hopeful that the degree with which they show outliers reflects some level of the degree of severity. Um, I mean, this is a basic inflammation response. I think as we move forward, we will have different kinds of internal signals, like I have a continuous glucose monitor on me now, and I know exactly what food does to what my glucose does, and I would like to see some level of that for certain con kinds of other viral detections. I think some of that, I hate to say it's gonna be easier to deal with than other ways. I envision a toilet sensor being a better way to possibly pick up pathogens and things like that, and so not a wearable per se, but still a very health-related device. So I, I think it would be very powerful to be able to know what pathogens people are acquiring when it happens. Uh, I do think other signatures uh, will show themselves, like the insulin resistance. I think we'll be able to figure that out by other ways, and I know there are contact lenses and ways of doing that sort of stuff too, but I, I, I think we'll figure this out in other ways, uh, either by looking at certain parameters and signals or by direct measurements of biomolecules. So I think both are possible. So one vote for flushables, it sounds like. <laughs> oh, yeah, and flushables will be powerful. <laughs> Well, there yeah. is a very interesting concept. If I can add one more, I take one more moment here. It, it's interesting. We have the technology now. You can tell when anyone gets a cold and what it is, but we never exercise that, right? You wait for it to go away. And when it doesn't go away, then you figure out what it is, like, oh, it's mono. But by then, they've infected, you know, 100 other people. So if you think about it, we have it all backwards. We should be figuring out every single time what people have. So if they have mono, you quarantine them quickly. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. very interesting. My name is Ann Stevens, and I'm with a company called Plum Kid Apps. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the logistics of the collection and the data reduction, because this is a lot of data, uh -huh. and the tools are pretty rudimentary. Oh, they are very rudimentary. Yeah. We did the, the started with the most obvious, which is we're only looking for deviations from basic. First of all, the data are available. You can download them, so you can play with them yourself. I know some groups are already doing this. Uh, second is we started, we made it easy. We said, let's just pick deviations from resting heart rate, either nighttime or daytime. 
And those signals, uh, you can just look for, you know, you can set windows and look for a uh, number of measurements that are deviations with certain false positive rates. We have several years of data, you can set this pretty, we think, pretty robustly for an individual person. Uh, I do think the more powerful measurements, though, will be when people are doing activities, much like a stress echo picks up heart defects when people exercise, and I think airline flights are gonna be great for picking out people with pulmonary problems uh, because you will see more severe reaction to those. I think that will be true for these devices as well. If we can pick up when people have deviations from, like when they're walking, they should have a higher heart rate, and if that's more standard deviations away, there's a bigger problem probably there. So I do think we need to tune them to, the act, to activities which will actually bring out bigger perturbations where there might be bigger health issues. But just so a quick corollary to that, uh -huh. did you develop your own software to measure these deviations or do you have a package you used? Uh, no, we had, I mean, we had to do all this from scratch. That's yeah, what I thought. Because oh. it didn't exist. Thanks. Uh, we're, gonna go, we're gonna go on to the next speaker, okay. but there'll be time to ask questions also during, um, uh, during the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Matthew. Okay, our next speaker is uh, uh, Spiros uh, Papapetropoulos, a, got that one, I think, hey, uh, VP and um, a global head of uh, uh, Neuro Neuro um, at uh, Teva. It's okay, I'll handle it, thank you so yeah. much. Um, I have the most unpronounceable name. Uh, so, um, I'm a neurologist, uh, trained in movement disorder, so that's what I do. I, I've always been intrigued um, on, 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 on ideas that could quantify human, human function. And, and what better than just, uh, just movement? I'm a father of two. Uh, I live in Boston. Uh, I flew here on a 777 full of uh, marathon runners. I thought that that was fit. But forget it. Forget it. So, um, delighted to be here. Uh, I'm also a, a big Star Trek fan, so that, that has inspired my uh, digital aspiration. So uh, a lot of things uh, Captain Kirk and uh, Sulu and others have figured out way before we uh, we ever got into it. Um, you know, perhaps uh, uh, warped speed and, and teleportation is our next big thing, but you know, we'll see. I uh, have to start my presentation. I hate slides. I don't like slides, but uh, people make me, make me do them. So I hope they uh, they look good. Okay, um, I'm not, this, you know, a couple of disclaimers here. Yes, a couple of disclaimers here. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be um, um, expressing the views of Teva. Teva is a pharmaceutical company. Uh, I also have an appointment of Ma in, at Mass General Hospital. Uh, these are my own, my own personal views, and they have nothing to do with standards and regulations, so these are uh, thoughts, collected thoughts on, on digital. And I'm going to be, I'm going to try to convince you that in drug development and in the way we make drugs and do clinical research, uh, digital health, uh, e-health, m-health is not everything. It's just a small part of what is needed, but it's a very, very critical part. Um, you all know that the world is changing. Um, there is, uh, without a doubt, uh, a, a big transformation that is happening, that is technology enabled, uh, and it's, it's definitely affecting healthcare. There is convergence of technology and healthcare that is ongoing. This is not new. Convergence have started about, about uh, 20 years ago. Um, uh, the lines are not, are not there yet, and it will take, some people talk about the eternal journey of convergence between technology and, and health simply because technology travels at different speeds uh, than health and, and, and uh, uh, health advances. So it's, uh, it's uh, perhaps an aspirational goal to think that we can, uh, we can fully align them, but it's worth, uh, it's worth the effort. Uh, so uh, for, the fifth, for the next about 15 minutes, um, I'm, I'm gonna try to convince you that we've made a lot of strides and there's a lot of opportunity, but I'm gonna try to communicate some of the major, major challenges. But before doing so, I always like to start with a vision of the future. So what are we looking to create here? What is our end goal? Is our end goal to uh, cure disease? Is our end goal to um, um, produce better drugs? So 
I have a short movie here, uh, which I don't take credit for. Uh, some, of, some of the colleagues of mine at Teva take all the credit, but it reflects and it gives a, um, a, a sense of vision in what we're trying to do in everyday life and everyday healthcare, and that's what drug development is all about. I, I said that sometimes it works, sometimes 95% of the times I'm, you know, there you go, we might. So this is an asthma patient trying to go to sleep, making uh, uh, plans to visit uh, his mother next morning. He goes to sleep and then suspense starts happening. About 2 a.m. he starts feeling something. Tossing and turning. <coughs> coughing. I think it's a, an asthma attack. His inhaler is next to him. He takes it, it's e-connected, gives immediate feedback on his lung function, connects it to the allergens and the local forecast. And then sends an alert that something is not going well. It's predicting more challenge. Immediately the system connects it to the physician where there's an instant diagnosis and an instant intervention. The physician prescribes steroids and the patient goes to the 3D printer. He takes the steroids, he's done his rescue inhalers, he goes back to sleep and that's the end of the story. And perhaps, perhaps, he might be able to get to his date with his mother. Everything seems under control. Sleep patterns, oxygen saturation, heart rate, everything that Michael showed. They both wake up and they prepare for the date. But there's another surprise waiting. The mother is a diabetic and the system is preparing for her her daily dose of anti-diabetic medication. A lot of them, all at the same time. These are mostly censored, enabled pills. They know the system and the platform knows that they were ingested. But a wearable closed loop system monitors glucose and glucose is still high. Thank God there is a implantable multi-well chip that can deliver additional boost in controlling glucose. And there you go. What could have been a disaster on multiple fronts was diverted and that's a nice story and by the way we're not all that far from this story it's actually reality we have closed loop systems that can monitor and intervene um, and, and, and modulate um, blood glucose so this is not science fiction okay I must admit some of it is but um, uh, but I, I don't want to ruin all the fun here Okay, so I'm going to resume the presentation and I'm going to try to avoid uh, repetition. You know, we all know that technology and big data analytics and artificial intelligence um, are rapidly evolving, evolving and, and we all know that uh, mostly everything can nowadays be, be measured uh, by wearables, uh, digestibles, implantables, whatever, you name it. Uh, there, is, there is a lot of hype. There is a lot of promise there, um, and, and, and people are being equipped with all sorts of interesting consumer uh, great technologies to, uh, to do so. Um, however, how ready are we to apply this change big time? And thinking about clinical research, how ready are we 
to implement some of the, uh, these paradigms in clinical research. I personally believe that we are, we are ready, and we are getting uh, better um, every moment. We are all equipped with smartphones. Um, physicians and patient relationship is changing. Physicians, uh, patients' attitudes towards healthcare is, is changing. Uh, physician, uh, patients are becoming a lot more engaged, a lot more involved, a lot more educated. Uh, they turn to social media for, for answers. So they are actually adopting a lot of what's happening and they're consuming a lot of what's happening. So for you that manage patients, there are a lot of educated patients out there and a lot more to come, especially as the generations uh, evolve and we're now at, at, at the digital native uh, generation. When, when these people come to age, and they, they will very soon, this transformation will be um, um, almost complete. So the, the, the environment is ready, the environment is ripe. Physicians have already adopted technology. Of course, they complain a lot about it. They spend a lot of time on uh, electronic medical records. They uh, tend to get their education online. Uh, they're very comfortable with using, using technology and they're um, ready, somehow ready, almost ready. They're never gonna be fully ready uh, because they're not taught um, uh, digital medicine in med school, so they have to self-educate, but they're getting, um, uh, they're, they're getting ready. So everyone is, is ready, patients are ready to adopt, physicians are there, uh, but unfortunately the sad reality is that we're still doing the same um, things in, in clinical development. So trials and the clinical uh, development cascade is long, uh, it takes about 10 to 15 years and several billion dollars to uh, uh, complete. In many instances, uh, our, our inability to detect drug efficacy is a limitation of development itself and the process itself. Uh, and it's not uh, pharmacology. So at times it's the how we do clinical development and how we develop drugs rather than the what we develop that is broken. So bad trials, biased approaches, uh, insensitive measures, operational failures uh, are just a few of the things uh, that define success or failure in clinical development. Uh, and the price of failure is very, uh, very high. So the clinical trial enterprise has remained relatively unchanged, again, for 20 or 30 years. And uh, it's all centered around sites and physicians. Patients are enrolled in physical sites, um, scattered ac across different states and countries. And we keep on equipping the sites with uh, and investing in sites more and more. And, and this enterprise is becoming more expensive because we're uh, investing in more uh, sensing, in, in, more, in more infrastructure for the sites and not to the patients. I got it. Um, the average cost per drug is um, about $5.5 billion for big companies. Smaller companies can get away with less. Um, and the average cost of failure is $1.2 billion if the drug fails late stage in phase three. As a result, um, our productivity has failed, has fallen tremendously. Um, the number of new approvals is overall declining uh, despite increasing costs. Here's a, a depiction of the a graph on the number of drugs approved in the US per billion dollars spent. And, and you can see it has nearly halved ev roughly every nine years. And that's not all. Um, during a six month trial, that's the average duration of a trial, let's say it's six months, a participant spends about 4,380 hours experiencing the effects of an experimental drug uh, and only about 50 hours providing information about his experiences in site visits. So there is a lot of wasted resource and a lot of wasted effort. So information captured during these patient visits um, uh, at sites are full of recall bias, um, and they add to and to add to the complex to, to this complexity, they're subject to interpretation. So uh, it is it is despite our best efforts, uh, we're only left with artificial snapshots of uh, data. 
that uh, we are called to make decisions upon, and that costs the system billions and billions of dollars. So what about the rest of the time? What about the rest 4,300 plus hours of lost information and the cost to patients and families that have to travel to sites and, and have to uh, change their schedule? So it's, uh, it's um, uh, a, a, a broken system. So we're left with uh, an, an unsustainable drug development paradigm. Too long, too expensive. It's definitely not fun for patients. Um, that, by the way, they are called subjects when they go to a research site, subject X and subject uh, Y. They don't even receive a thank you letter at the end of the day. So it's a, a broken system. No one is happy. Healthcare system, payers, no one is happy. Um, uh, imagine how do I, I mean, how people in my position feel when we are uh, asked to work on something that has about 5% chance of success uh, in, the, in the beginning, as we're entering this cascade, uh, and it takes us 10 to 12 years to complete it. So, uh, not fun, not fun. mHealth could make clinical development better, smarter, um, but it's not just mHealth. Um, and we can, there are so many different approaches that help adherence, you can uh, find gamification, uh, approaches, uh, ways to improve training, telemedicine, use social media, electronic consenting, uh, smart pills, closed loop de deliveries, and, and biometric monitoring um, uh, to improve uh, the drug development cascade. This is not enough. We still need good drugs. Uh, we, need, we need effective therapies. Uh, we need to identify the right mechanisms, uh, have uh, the right tools, and combine with omics and biomarkers uh, to make the process uh, uh, successful. It's not easy, it takes a lot of infrastructure. Uh, it takes uh, building of a cloud um, uh, a, a, a with, with multiple layers, uh, integrating data, aggregating and analyzing data. Um, it's very expensive and it also uh, takes a, uh, a mindset change, especially in pharma. Um, it's not business as usual for pharma. Uh, we need to have a vision, a plan. We have to agree to take risks. Uh, we have to change the way we um, uh, structure our processes to make them adaptable, work together, share more, and build the right infrastructure. And perhaps if we're successful, we're gonna be able to transform healthcare uh, in the process. Two minutes. May I have two minutes more? Sure. Thank you. Um, because I, I, I love Ida's stop sign there, but uh, it's quite distracting. So uh, better, better ask for permission rather than ignore it. So, so this is my list of challenges, and we can have um, as much conversation as, as, many, as, much conversation as, as you like during our panel or uh, after, after the talk. Um, this is not to discourage anyone, but uh, for, for us in, in drug development, um, behavioral challenges, institutional challenges, technological channel challenges, regulatory, operational, data-related challenges, scientific and access challenges all apply. So we have to slowly solve each and every single challenge, and for everything we solve, there is another challenge that comes up. Um, one of my favorite is the behavioral challenge, and it's very tightly connected to the mindset. We have to convince ourselves that there is no other path forward. Uh, that's why the long introduction, and that's why the vision. Uh, the hurdles are there, but uh, they're there to be, to be um, uh, um, tackled, and uh, the transformation has already started. So a lot of companies have, um, including, including the, the you know, Teva and Pfizer, it's a company that worked before Teva, have taken on the challenge of uh, pushing the envelope in the digital space. Again, that's, these are my two minutes, and uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me and for uh, your attention. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. So, uh, one of the, in listening to your talk, one of the things I was so struck by was um, 
sort of, I would say, the contrast between the um, almost the relentless optimism and the reality on the ground in pharma research, which you acknowledge, but you know, if the you're right that there are digital health or mobile health studies that are underway. Um, and we actually talked about this on our podcast with uh, the, the people who direct M Health at, at Metadata, you know, who, who are leaders at some of these coordinating some of these studies. But most of them are very exploratory. They're sort of proof of concept. They're sort of, you know, in endocrine you might say like pseudo pseudo hypo para studies. I mean, they're they're very, um, you know, preliminary. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the question is, um, is it because? You, you highlight here a huge number of potential problems. Hmm. Is it fundamentally that the many of the wearables and the technologies are kind of consumer grade and aren't robust enough for use in rigorous clinical research? Or do you think it's more the mindset issue that you talk about and that as long as they're perceived to be alternatives, peop people are gonna continue to do what they always have done with the feeling that there's more regulatory security there? I think it's either or. I, I, I strongly believe that there is no business case for, uh, for digital health currently. And that's that limiting... seems like a problem. <laughs> so so it's, it's not science, it's not research, uh, it's not technology, it's not analytics. It's just lack of business case. So there's who's no gonna, Who's going to pay but, for but it? To take what you're saying, but there's no value. I mean, you just presented, I'm not trying to be difficult here, but you presented a slide. I mean, I'm fascinated by this. But you present a slide that essentially says, you know, 95% of the data are being missed. There's no business case for capturing that value? No, but yeah. The, how, how do you monetize capturing 95% of more data? Right. So, I mean, that's sort of the issue. Is it, is, is, that's really the issue. Is there some real value in that? that, that, that that's, that's a major, major issue. The reality, the scientific reality is that we, our, our, our clinical research is outdated. But there should be bad. value there. I mean, there should be value there, right? I mean, if we're preaching that, oh, it's all about continuous and not episodic, but you can capture the value just as well at an occasional visit, and you can't demonstrate the value of all the intermediate... intermediate. Absolutely. So we're in the beginning of it all. Okay. We are in the I beginning. I want to make sure we get to the questions. I apologize. Uh, and Robert both Mc questions this time. Robert McBurney from the iConquer MS People Powered Research Network. Um, there is a parallel movement, in fact, a very similar uh, s business case issue. So there's a parallel movement that's going on in healthcare, which is learning health, learning health systems and learning health communities. And if I look at the challenges of learning health communities, they're the same challenges exactly. as that you up, have up, up there. So how do you see this proprietary uh, drug development process merging or going hand in hand with the emerging learning health system movement? Okay, that, that's, that's a very, very important question. And uh, just my, 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 my two cents here, I've give, I'm giving talks about healthcare and drug development and they always converge and the set of challenges are indeed the same. These are the set of challenges that we're facing as we're trying to transform healthcare. My bias is that I think clinical research will transform healthcare and not the other way around. So we have to prove and we have to learn how to walk before we run. We're now crawling. And unless we prove value and we do all the necessary studies to prove value of digital platforms in, in the actual research setting, this paradigm or these paradigms are never going to be adopted by healthcare big time. So that, that's, my, that's my bias. Talking to other folks, they think the opposite should happen. And that's, that's another value proposition. Okay, I want to, we missed you last time. I want to get your question now and then yours and then we'll get to the next speaker. Sure, hi, I'm um, Dexter Hadley. I'm faculty at UCSF and I find myself in a big data AI sort of research environment. And my, um, I've been following Mike's work with the quantified self for a few years now. And my question is quite simple. So I think the problem with deriving value is we have real, really poor labels. From an AI perspective, we need good outcomes. And just sensors and, and data, more data upon data, is, it doesn't really get us to a, an impactful label. So how is it that, that we can stop, um, we could sort of increase the specificity of what we're doing, right? So 
there, there are many different outcomes physicians sort of deal with, common ones being common, like taking um, steroids for asthma is a, is a pretty common outcome. But how do we get to the rare outcomes with this kind of sensor and mobile health push if we really can't quantify them? The patient themselves can't quantify such an outcome. It's almost as though we have to go after the people with the knowledge, the physicians, are the ones that are, are going to quantify this outcome, but they're not caught up in this digital health craze like, like physicians are. So it seems like we could never um, get a level of specificity to, to derive value, but so to speak, one without thing, proper outcomes. There, there, it's a, this is, these are all very valid points, and, and we have to be more specific, more sensitive. We need to do what we do now better, but the value is really going to be driven by what we don't know now. So if if, I, if I, uh, AI and digital can deliver something that is not obvious to humans or not immediately obvious to us, if they can deliver the unknown, the unexpected, something that will make the car into a spaceship or something that will make a, a horse into a car, then value is not going to be um, obvious, obviously there for us. I think a real transformation is needed, and we're not there at the tipping point yet. Yeah, I mean, I think that's great. It's also a great panel discussion point, too, but I, my own view is we do need to capture that data that you're arguing is missing. We do need to see how often events are happening, how many are false positives, how many true positives, and I think there's enough people are motivated. We could, should be able to organize studies that do capture that in some useful fashion. I think... Yeah. Panel Sounds like a good panel topic. Why don't we <laughs> get to it later? Yeah. yeah. I want to get to your question as well. Yeah. Uh, Rob McRae, Wireless Life Sciences Alliance. Um, so looking at the 95% of data that is not captured because there's no economic model, if you, um, and I know this is just your personal opinion, but thinking about regulated drug companies, if there was a way where you could envision that um, you could reduce that pre-market investment by a substantial amount, a third to 50%, would that create the economic model to capture that information and actually utilize it? Obviously, the concept being that they are linked by capturing that information and using it in uh, uh, determining the safety and effectiveness of the product, you get faster to market, and you know, there is, it, and that's improve. that's the current business model, model that that we're pushing faster and better, uh, because it's not necessarily cheaper. It's actually more expensive. Uh, the last deployment of a of a digital platform in a trial, which is was actually a registrational trial, I had a case study. No time, a little time. Uh, some other. I, I'm happy to to share the case study with anyone that is interested. It's a collaboration between our group at Teva and Intel. Um, uh, cost us four million dollars for six patients, for 60 patients, four million dollars to build it, deploy it, just to collect exploratory data. But this is in the context of validating and using on the go. It's not piloting. I, I detest piloting. I think this is what got us here in the first place. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you very much for your, uh, for, for such a great conversation. Okay, our next speaker representing the uh, next speaker representing the health system perspective is uh, Laura Wilt uh, from uh, Ochsner Health System. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you. And let me just bring up some of my talk here. Great. So um, I thought that I would take this opportunity to really speak with all of you. Um, about a health systems perspective on sort of how we can use apps, wearables, and digital health to bring us into the future and really do, I think, hopefully uh, address some of the, the topics that we were just talking about is can there be a business case for how this can make sense um, for health systems? So I'll, I'll take a little bit of a different perspective and, and try to share that with you. Uh, many of you have heard, and I, I saw how many physicians there were, so I would be very interested in your feedback, but many of you have heard of the quadru the triple aim. Um, this came out in about 10 years ago from IHI, and this was saying this is what all healthcare really should be working towards, uh, population health, 
reducing costs and um, improving quality. So that's patient experience, that's how they, they do that. Um, what we realized in healthcare is that we were missing something, a very important point, and, and you'll notice that on the side, it's the provider satisfaction. So it's how providers can use this. I think our uh, first speaker mentioned one of the biggest challenges that you foresee will be the provider adoption for new technologies. I think that's something that we see too. So when we think about what should we be doing and how should we be directing our efforts, one of the things that we think about from a health system perspective is achieving this quadruple aim. So taking care of populations of patients, reducing costs, improving quality, and all the while making it easier for our physicians, which should be easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Some of the ways that we've been thinking about that, I think if you, if you take sort of break this apart, um, we've proven that patients' engagement and involving patients in their care is very effective in both quality and population health. There are numerous studies that many of you all have probably written and read that prove that patients that are engaged in their care will improve their health just by, just by the fact that they're engaged in their care. So how do we take that, though, and, and build upon it? So in terms of challenges that we have with that, if we can prove that engaging patients is valuable, which I think we have, then how do we engage them? How do we have, there's thousands and thousands of health apps, there's thousands of devices, how do you decide what's effective, and how do you get those devices and those apps into patients' hands? That, as a health system, is something that's been very challenging for us. So one of the ways that we think about that is we introduce something um, that's called the O-Bar. So this is modeled after the Apple Genius Bar, actually. Um, it's a place that's in our primary care centers that patients can come. You can see there's just apps sort of lined up. You can sit there and just play with things. You don't have to do anything. It's really supposed to be that Genius Bar concept where you can come and just try things out. We have uh, the opportunity where you can put in your email address and they'll send you the apps that you're interested in. So you can say, I'm interested in a dietary app and something else, and we'll send that to your smartphone. So it really in, empowers the patients to be involved in their care and provides them an easy, friendly opportunity to do so. Um, the other thing that we do at these locations is we also sell uh, devices and wearables. So you can buy, you can't buy a smartphone, it's not an actual Apple Genius Bar, um, but you can buy you can buy Fitbits, you can buy blood pressure cuffs, you can buy scales, you can buy things like that that we can incorporate then into your care. Um, the second thing that we do is we provide face-to-face -face instructions. So I'll talk a little bit about one of the programs that we have that we call the Digital Hypertension Digital Medicine Program. The average age of patients in that program are 68 years old. Um, additionally, I should have mentioned this in the beginning, Ashner Health System is located in New Orleans, Louisiana, which is um, not necessarily known for being very active and healthy or tech savvy, perhaps, uh, but rather very fun and uh, many other good qualities, but those would not be them. Um, so this face-to-face -face instruction has been really important for our patients as well. It allows them to have a friendly face that can help them use their smartphone. One of the things that we talk about when we talk about the, the folks who work at the OBAR is the most common question that they get asked is, um, what's, the, what's my Apple password? So, that's uh, the biggest barrier for us to getting apps into patients' hands is they don't know that information off the top of their head. So then the best way to answer that question, by the way, is to say, can you call your son or daughter? Um, and they will normally know it. But, but having someone facilitate that process has been very helpful for us. Um, we can also do things like properly sized blood pressure cuffs, which is very critical to our program that I'll talk about. So if we know that patients prefer apps, and we know that we have patients with smartphone. I thought one of the things that was very um, surprising to me was this study that was done with 2,000 patients that both have both a chronic disease and a smartphone. The number of patients that are willing to take a medication, to fill a medication that's prescribed by their doctor for that chronic disease is only two-thirds of those patients. Those same patients, over 90% of them, are willing to use an app. So now we've sort of fixed this problem about how do we engage patients, how do we get this into their hands, we know it can improve health, how do we make it easy for our doctors? That quadruple aim is one that is very important to us. So, so we have tried a couple things that way, but one of them is instead of having to educate our physicians on blood pressure cuffs, on how to size them, on how to sell them, where to go and get them, or even to um, educate them on the apps that are out there. Instead, we give the physicians a prescription pad. We tell them this is what this service does for you. This is what the OBAR can help you do. And now you can just have these in your office, check off what you want the patient to go do. So I want them to have a wellness app. 
um, then that patient can go to the OBAR and say, here, I, I, my doctor recommended that I come look here for a wellness app. So that's one thing that we're doing to help make physicians' lives a little bit easier. Another thing, and I don't think I could um, say anything without talking about our Innovation Oshner group, which is a group led by Dr. Milani, who's on this, um, really is to address the quadruple aim, we built the Hypertension Digital Medicine Program, and that's what I'll talk a little bit about. So that is based on this idea of, um, on the right-hand side of the screen, about how we can Im involve apps, wearables, with self-monitoring, oh, maybe I'll get that, yeah. Self-monitoring and home monitoring, and how that enables something that we call specialized integrated practice units, or IPUs. So instead, the traditional healthcare model, where the patient comes to see the PCP, and then that patient's really directed to separate places within the health system, instead, the way that we think about it in the future is building these IPUs that combine things like patient education, dietary, exercise. Um, we have pharmacists on call. We have uh, planners and just overall wellness representatives that participate in these IPUs, which we can enable because now we have data available to us because those patients, those same patients can go buy wearables, get apps, provide that data, it's integrated into our EMR, and those IPUs can work in that area. This is the way we think about this, and this is what we base our digital medicine program on. So with that, there's also sort of continuous feedback, I guess I would say, this feedback that's over here that goes directly to the patient, it doesn't bypass the provider, but the provider is no longer the person that's the facilitator of that or the holder of that information. We ask our providers to do so many different things. Now we can have, we can leverage these other clinicians and professionals to contact the patient directly. So one of the things that we do there is we provide these um, reports that go home monthly. Um, they're sent electronically through the patient portal, but they're also sent on paper, which I think is something a little bit unique that we um, thought was really important because this now engages patients' families or their friends and their care. So a spouse might not log into the portal for a patient, but they're very willing to see a piece of paper that's sitting on the kitchen counter and look at it and say, oh, you're doing really well with your blood pressure. Um, so that's one of the things. And then just brief, brief moment on outcomes is we have seen a very high control rate after 90 days. Um, the average patient that's in the control groups Blood pressures are, you know, under 15% controlled. With the patients that are in this digital medicine program, we're seeing rates of 60, 65, 70% control rate for hypertension. I wanted to briefly mention how this also helps reduce costs because that is the fourth part of the quadruple aim. Um, and it's not necessarily as obvious, but we have a large capitated population, so anything that we can do to help prevent that patient from being seen in other scenarios from having any events or something like that is something that helps us reduce the cost, um, but also um, provides, again, the patient experience and the provider work life. The, I think before I wanted to mention just this, some of the challenges to adoption, I know there are a lot of physicians here. There have been a lot of research recently about physician burnout and about how physicians um, are asked to do so many different things the number one cause is too many bureaucratic tasks. If you think about some of the advancements that we all think about, um, meaningful use and MACRA and other governmental things, measuring quality that help try to achieve that quadruple aim, um, one of the, I think, one of the downsides to that has been that we've been asking our providers to take on a lot of that work. So the pri providers have been doing all of that work so that we can measure quality and ensure outcomes and do all the things that we need to do. Um, but that's been very difficult, which I think leads to physician, physician um, adoption challenges that many of you have experienced. The second thing that I'll say is that this is an example, and this one's actually old from Venture Scanner. Um, this is just sort of a landscape of what's going on from a technology perspective in healthcare right now. And, and again, this one's a couple years old. If you can imagine that every one of these companies and initiatives is coming to a provider group like mine or like many of yours and is saying, we have all these ideas and here's the things we can do. How do we decide how that we can prioritize one over the other and how do we make physicians' life easier? in doing that. So it's just an overwhelming amount of things that are going on right now for our physicians. So that's why we've really focused on this, this IPU model uh, because it takes work off of the physician. So if you think about this in, um, if there are any cardiologists, the Coumadin clinic model, 
That's been going on for a while. You can refer your patients into the Coumadin Clinic. Pharmacists there that specialize in that will now manage those patients for you. You're still involved in their care. You're still their primary care provider or you're still their cardiologist. But um, you're not necessarily involved in the day-to-day -day changing of their medications. It's the same idea for chronic disease management, which is how we can use the data that we're getting real time to then make care decisions and help the patients, but without having to do that at the expense of what the provider's taking time to do. Um, I think I'll close with the other thing that I think was a little bit unexpected for me was the importance of the OBAR. I can say I was probably um, excited about it from just kind of a coolness factor, but I didn't see it as critical to the success of the program. And it was unexpected that it is because of all those things I mentioned, because of how we engage with the patients on a sort of person-to-person -person level about their health, but it's not necessarily in the context of their physician talking to them about it. Um, that has been a really, really impactful for us because I think there's a large barrier to entry um, without having something like that. So I think I can take a couple questions. Great, yeah, I thought that was uh, fascinating. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. I thought that your comment at the end uh, really refers to the, the OBAR and the challenges of, of, last, of crossing the last mile and sort of, you know, leaving with a, you know, here's what you do and helping people to actually navigate their way onto, onto the smartphone. One quick question that I did have was a lot of these studies that sort of show, you know, benefits of approach A versus B. They tend not to be randomly selected. It tends to be, well, these are self-selected patients and the combination of sort of enthusiastic patients who are excited about this and sort of self-identified, potentially with a little bit of Hawthorne effect. I, I don't know how you, uh, do you worry about that? Um, I think we do, and actually the, the way that we approach it really is to involve the excited physicians first. So it might actually be on the physician side. We only started, um, not just pilot, but we just started the program with physicians who were very interested in participating. We've expanded it now. We have 200 physicians that participate in sending their patients into this program, sort of regardless of, of that. It's a recommendation from the physician, but the patient doesn't have to necessarily do it. Very cool. Hi, Rebecca Mitchell, a medical director and head of clinical product at Validic. Um, I have a question um, related to a lot of the new data that you're bringing in in front of the providers. Um, so something that we're seeing a lot in the market is, um, let's take a specific example, like blood pressure and hypertension. An individual reading maybe once a week, clinicians absolutely know what to do with that to the extent that they trust it. When we see patients that are taking blood pressure maybe two to three times per day, you're starting to see some really interesting morphologies and behaviors that nobody's used to seeing. Um, like we've worked with some of the best cardiologists, pharmacists in the country, um, and are very quickly getting to places where there is no literature on the proper course of treatment. There's no literature. They don't have any past experience on how to titrate a medication, um, how to advise around behavioral interventions. And I'm just curious if you've seen any of that being a blocker to uptake within your institution, um, and regardless sort of where you see some of that guidance coming from, because we're making decisions about whether or not we partner with some of these new AI, like big data companies, to offer that, or if that will be something that'll be rejected by the provider community. Sure, I, that's a great point. I think one of the things that helped us as the champion for this project I mentioned is our chief transformation officer, Dr. Milani. He's a cardiologist by training as well. So he was able to address some of those as to how you would manage hypertension, obviously use evidence-based standards as well. We have probably 100, I think we average about 160 blood pressure readings in the three months that we look at for, for this study in particular um, for patients that are enrolled in the program compared to two or three from patients who aren't. Um, so it really is having a lot more data, but then we did build some algorithms to, to look at the standard deviation of what the readings are. And, if, and we do have a program that says if we get a very high reading, um, we automatically text the patient, so it, there's different sort of levels, but the first level is we automatically text the patient that says, your reading looked high, can you take it again? Can you sit down and take it again? Um, so that happens. If it's very high, if it's over two standard deviations away, then we call the patient and talk to them because we have sort of those real-time health coaches, clinicians that are monitoring the data on a real-time basis as well. So it's not in the middle of the night, but still during the day. Another question, do you, uh, while we're waiting for additional questions, do you have a, a syst uh, systematic approach for your funnel for going from the thousands and thousands of potential apps you might recommend to the handful that you offer at the OBAR? Um, there is an approach. I can't say that it is 
entirely as systematic as one would maybe like it to be, but we, we do look at them. We have sort of a group of people that are curating the apps. It's not to say that it's perfect process, but we, that's the process that we're using today. Terrific. Well, thank, let me see, any other questions? No, okay, well, thank you so much. That was fascinating. We have uh, Cedric Hutchings, uh, who formerly of Wythings and uh, now VP of uh, Digital Health at Nokia. Thank you very much. So m my name is easy to pronounce, Hutchings. Uh, the company's name, uh, Wythings, is, is uh, much harder. And uh, so it's long story short, it's what happens when French guys come up with an English name. So, uh, you know, and uh, I've, I've been myself saying it in a different way. So I'm, uh, I'm very glad and honored to be here. I was very fascinated uh, with from some of the former uh, presentation. And you know, I'm glad in a way to be part of this community. And uh, hopefully what I can share is, is that uh, somewhat by chance, uh, you know, I came up uh, to this uh, community. So I'm the co-founder of, uh, of Wedding, so yeah, I should start. Sorry for that. Here we go. Uh, so, you know, for the past nine years uh, at Wizings, we developed digital health products and applications that at first help people uh, transform the way how people manage their own health. And we started, and I think we always uh, will start with the individual. Wizings uh, joined Nokia uh, back in June 2016, and I'm now leading uh, the digital health activity at Nokia out from uh, the San Francisco and, uh, and Sunnyvale offices, so quite near here. So I discovered that you know, Nokia's current goal, and I, I just take a second on it, is to be uh, expanding the human, tech, human possibility of technologies. I really like uh, to make a pause here because until the very last presentation, I, I, I did not hear a lot about the user-centric view, the end-user view, and I think it's very important, and as a tech you know, company, you know, for sure we are very careful on, uh, and we try every day not to develop technologies that uh, you know, people will be uh, serving, but really the, the other way around. So today, I would like to you know, spend a few minutes with you and, and share you know, our vision of digital health and maybe most, more importantly, a few examples on how we execute uh, toward this vision. So we believe that, uh, I'd say here, that the cures is really in the data. And as I think we, you all understand here, what I mean by that is that uh, massive patient-generated health data uh, contain a lot of insight uh, that will inform medicine, that can save lives, uh, and that in many ways. And I would like to speak about three challenges uh, for this really to happen, that we have tackled over the past years, and we're still working on. The first one is, how do we generate uh, a consistent and sustainable stream of data, of consistent data? And how do we do that on the long term? With no data, there will not be uh, insight. Second is how do we make insight out, out of this data? You know, how do we make a knowledge out of this data? And third, for sure, I talk about sa saving lives. So how do we inform action? How do we turn this insight into actions? So at the beginning I said, so we start with the individual. So back uh, nine years ago, we developed a, a scale as uh, engineers, uh, and we wanted to do a, a useful scale. So a scale that will simply, in, instead of just throwing and, and maybe triggering an emotion when you step on it, that will monitor your weight. And, and the way we see uh, monitoring is uh, graphing. Uh, and uh, we were you know, doing a scale that will simply graph the weight trend, weight devolution, uh, in uh, the device that now happens to be uh, very frequently in our pockets on a smartphone, and eventually share this information uh, if it's useful for the user to share a weight trend or weight evolution. So think about nutritionist or any kind of caregiver or coach. That's how we started. 
And in fact, we discovered that uh, something that was totally unexpected from, for us is that it turned out to be a behavioral change device. It did trigger some, some change of behavior that we did measure. Uh, we did get a lot of testimonial but, uh, by our users, but literally we were measuring uh, the weight loss, uh, change of behavior, uh, increased activity just by using this device. We were you know, digging and uh, underst trying to understand what happened, but uh, the very notion of having this constant feedback loop uh, that is stream without calling for any extra step, actually, any uh, going uh, too much away from your routine, does generate uh, some change of behavior. And that informed the rest of our roadmap and the story of uh, Withings back uh, at the time. So the scale was soon uh, joined by other connected health devices. Uh, so blood pressure monitor, trackers, sleep sensors, thermometers, so all devices ranging both from uh, unregulated or what will be called wellness space to uh, regulated, so obviously like uh, blood pressure monitors uh, that are, uh, that requires a pre-market uh, authorization. Um, I will just also, I cannot help mentioning that, so I'm very glad to see that you know, the, uh, our blood pressure monitor is, is, using, is used by Oshner, and that you, you saw this image of the blood pressure uh, before. Uh, and I think it's not by chance, and when we developed each of our devices, we actually wanted to do to, that all these devices look cool and sexy, that people want to have it and want to use it. We did not take as a granted that the blood pressure monitor has to be something ugly and maybe that generates some anxiety and remind everybody, you know, everybody using it that you are sick and you sh should check your blood pressure monitor. I think part of the novelty of what we did is doing actually consumer grade products that can generate uh, medical grade or clinical grade uh, data information. I think it's, it's a very uh, important point. And also uh, across this uh, product, I do think that doing a simple to use uh, product does not prevent us to do very advanced uh, type of measurement. Uh, so we've all already, we've seen uh, in all, in uh, previous information, all the data that can be generated out of the device. Uh, our latest generation of, of scale does measure pulse wave velocity. So this is totally new, but it does not call for many, many new ways of using it. You may have to stand on a scale a few seconds more, but for the first time uh, in a home environment, we can capture and gather and monitor on the long term uh, pulse wave velocity, which is an ex essential uh, cardiovascular uh, risk, uh, risk factors. So I do think that we can do consumer grade device with you know, simple uh, and consumer grade ex experience uh, and that generate uh, on the long term because this device can fit in our everyday life for the long term, uh, but they generate stream of, of medical grade uh, data. So what do we do with this data to generate insights? Uh, basically, we look back, we look real time, and we look forward by setting up new cohorts. And I give you a few examples on, on each of, of these uh, ways to generate insight. Uh, looking back uh, is leveraging the fact that for the past years, we've developed mass massive uh, database of multidimensional across a large uh, you know, segment of population uh, data that we can de-identify and along with partners such as Scripps here and among many others, we can look back and, and spot on different trends and correlation. I think we, we heard it, uh, thanks to Michael and, and, uh, and also you know, recently, that having a baseline or generating a baseline is a very important factor. And for uh, hypertension, uh, remote patient or remote monitoring of, uh, of uh, hypertension, uh, understanding, better understanding uh, the variability of the blood pressure is, is a very uh, strong need. So we've looked back on our data and along with scripts, we spot on, on several uh, biased or uh, that uh, that were uh, visible in our in our database. So uh, we've did learn and publish uh, during uh, the American Heart Association uh, scientific uh, session uh, recently. Some of the learnings uh, uh, we did uh, uncover, discover on this database. So a bias between female and male by age on the on the index variability index of the blood pressure measuring weekdays and, uh, and weekends, and even surprisingly, surprisingly on the season. So we saw uh, uh, among our user base a higher variability of blood pressure during the winter time. Uh, 
So all these you know, insights obviously were uh, generated by looking back at our data. And we do uh, uh, have a lot of partnership and encourage, and uh, hopefully also here uh, today, encourage uh, partners who come to us uh, and, and, and uh, we can share some uh, anonymous and identify, unidentified uh, data uh, to you know, hopefully ge generate uh, this kind of insights that will inform uh, or create some, uh, some useful baseline. I talked about the past. We also generate and publish, so on our website, a real-time dashboard. So two examples among many others. Uh, we do a graph on real-time, and you can check on our website, uh, the percentage of overweight and obese uh, population by states here in the US, or on the right-hand side, uh, some correlation studies, uh, but that run, again, real-time between uh, sleep-deprived uh, users and, uh, and blood pressure status. So this information hopefully can help also inform some even public health policy uh, initiatives. Uh, we did recently uh, publish one in France that showed the prevalence of obesity across different cities. Uh, and these studies was called to change uh, the diets in the public school of the cities where, that were spotted as the most, uh, uh, showing the most uh, prevalence of obesity among young, uh, young population. So again, we are uh, the third point, so I'm conscious of the time, sorry. The third point is that we are looking also uh, forward, and uh, we know that we do not gather through our portfolio all the required uh, data sets, and we should complement this data set with many other, coming from device, coming from users and, and research team. And so we encourage to develop new cohorts uh, some example here with uh, partner with uh, Medicine X actually here to uh, call uh, for teams who will use uh, our devices and data set again looking forwards uh, in a controlled manner to spot to spot on on uh, trend and correlation. Uh, how we do translate you know uh, hopefully this uh, this uh, learnings and insight into actions. I just take two examples both ends from the end user point of view and from the caregiver point of view. Uh, first, as, as tech uh, developer, uh, we do inform our roadmap and, and specifically, our, our, specifically our product features roadmap uh, from the correlation and the insight I mentioned before. So a few examples, we've, we've measured that among our user base, uh, people who tend to set a weight goal uh, do uh, uh, experience a weight loss that is very much more sustainable on, on the long term than the people who do not. Of course, that informs the way we do uh, uh, propose and expose this type of feature in our application uh, to encourage people to set a goal, to encourage people to have um, uh, constant uh, refresh of their value. So for example, to encourage people to step on a scale. And that can you know, come up to very, uh, what will be weird features to encourage people to step on a scale, like showing off the weather forecast on the scale on the morning that just give an additional reason to step from time to time on the scale, but that we know uh, will impact the outcome of, of the scale usage. Uh, we also learn about uh, the needs for specific uh, coaching uh, programs that we also add in our application. So in a summary, we do inform and, and shape our product features and roadmap from this insight in order for our, user, our products to be more impactful on the end user behavior. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, so we have the, uh, a fascinating, fascinating uh, a presentation uh, with you know, what Oshner is doing, and so I'll be very short on, on uh, what we develop with uh, a solution called patient care uh, solution, remote patient uh, care solutions, uh, that enable physicians not to look at stream of data, and here in the case I show of stream of blood pressure monitor, but really have a stratified view of their whole uh, patient uh, population or set of the patient, uh, patient population, be notified uh, with spe specific interesting events. Sometimes a lack of measurement is much more uh, meaningful than a specific measurement. And so we are and work very hard, we are very aware and work very hard on making sure that what I, you know, uh, start my presentation with, with uh, ensuring that we develop a sustainable and constant uh, uh, data stream does not end up in a data flow at the other end of the spectrum. So I'm, sorry, I'm going uh, so very fast. I'm, I'd be very happy to discuss further with the panel and take any, uh, any questions uh, today. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, 
uh, great presentation, and um, uh, I feel like I should stand up here. Though I don't know if it would help or hurt the product if I uh, testify to using it, because uh, maybe it works well for blood pressure, less well for BMI. Um, the, uh, one, one of the uh, interesting points that you brought up, I thought at the end there, was the challenge that even was brought up earlier, where people talk about the problem of physicians being deluged by data, and of, well, what am I supposed, you know, what is a physician, the many in the audience, what do you do with patients who do what you want and, and actually start to check and are interested and are engaged, all those direct, wonderful qualities, and then they sort of start to present all this data that scare the crap out of them. Um, you know, the, the medical systems. It sounds like, if I'm hearing you right, you've approached that by creating a provider interface that essentially distills and makes sense of the information coming out of the other end. Is there a challenge to reach most providers with that approach, given how many use sort of formalized EMR systems? Yes, yeah, so, so, I mean, Obviously, that's part of the challenge, and, and obviously, it requires uh, some change of the organization. So, uh, and we've, we've got just previously a beautiful example on how we can reorganize uh, the unit and the caregivers uh, around this new stream of, of data. The second type of challenge is how do we plug on the AMR? Uh, we've been, uh, I think, quite pioneers on developing these APIs that enables our system to be plugged into any others. And we've been integrating in some of the major EHR here because we know that this is, this is only a partial view and we do not have, do not have the pretensions you know, of, right. of having but It seems a like the real value that you bring here is sort of making the data more useful and less scary. Mm -hmm. Instead of just saying, here, you can access this massive stream of numbers, your per, it's, if I'm hearing you right, it sounds like a, a big value add is organizing it in a way that is quickly um, useful for the provider. Is, is that insight translate into the EMR systems? Uh, that's, that's a good question. So in, uh, there are some health, uh, health systems that, and specifically EHR solutions that have modules uh, to have this view, which is really, uh, really new or disruptive from a EHR, you know, data set and just a patient profile. Uh, when we look, and, and we heard before, look at, uh, you know, uh, constant uh, monitoring and not just chunk of periodic, uh, periodic data sets. So just would like just to mention that on the other end, making insights is also calling for a new type of feature. When we talk about blood pressure monitoring, you can take one blood pressure monitoring and there are you know, ways to codify this measurement. But having one measure of blood pressure uh, doesn't mean you, are high, you have a hypertension. So we've added uh, features in our app so that you are entering a protocol and provided you comply with you know, certain series of measurements, you input some additional information on the context, you can have a feedback or, or you know, how you classify what's your state of, uh, of, tension, of blood pressure. Sir. Nice talk. You, ha you have lots of devices out there, so you're kind of in a nice position to be able to say which devices do people use the longest for which kinds of applications and which kinds of participants. Do you have data on that anywhere that you can talk about that we could all look at? So, yes, we do have data, and, and this user loyalty is, is, a, is a key parameter for, for us. Uh, you know, scales, you know, have been, you know, very successful in, in being, you know, once it's installed, it's set up, you know, again, it doesn't call for any type of weird stuff like uh, having your mobile phone next to it, et cetera, it's connected to Wi-Fi, so it's, it's very, and we have multi-year, uh, you know, uh, average loyalty uh, with this uh, device, but it informs every product we do. When we look at uh, sleep monitoring, uh, we believe in the uh, stationary uh, sensors, uh, because, you know, once it's set up under the mattress, it stays, and it does generate a new kind of loyalty. When we look at wearable, we are obsessed with battery life. So the, you are wearing three wearables, so I'm wearing one. Uh, that doesn't look like a wearable of sensors. Again, for, for us, it's very important. Uh, and also that, you know, works for one month and then uh, you recharge over one month. This is not a detail in order to, uh, to ensure that uh, these products are sustainable. What's your second longest device? Scale is probably the longest, but mm -hmm. second So I would say stationary device. So, uh, you know, clearly sleep sensors like a sleep pad are very, uh, once they're installed, they do not, uh, they are power plugs, so, you know, Quick question over here. Uh, you hinted at uh, data-driven personalized coaching. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Do you, do you try different 
coaching styles and you just see what works on the person, whether you berate them or, they, or, or uh, encourage them and, and just see if they're losing weight or gaining weight? So, uh, yes, uh, so we have a long history of uh, and seeing different type of uh, so uh, motivation. Uh, you know, so, uh, we've had some, you know, competitive features for people who like to be competitive. This notion of, uh, of uh, goal setting and tracking, so there is very, uh, you know, documented way uh, to motivate people. But what I was, you know, referring to is a feature that will, uh, we just announced and will be in the, in the coming months, uh, in integrating coaching program over a specific period with, you know, some, some uh, weeks of uh, learning, uh, discovery learning, and, and, uh, and adherence to certain the behavioral change that will be rolling out next um, summer. So hopefully you get you know, all the things that we've learned in the past working well and less well uh, will turn into this, uh, this feature. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, so I want to thank all the speakers for a really excellent session. Go again. Obviously a fantastic moderator. Uh, we will reconvene at 2, at 3.15. Good. At 3 o'clock. Yes, thank you. I'll believe them, not you. How's that? Okay. We'll reconvene at 3 o'clock. There's some snacks and refreshments. So, and uh, we'll have the panel and then lightning talks and then posters.
panel discussion with, uh, come on down, Mike, come on down. Spiros, come on down. Laura, Cedric. <laughs> All righty, and I'm, I'm going to like, I'm going to be ambulatory. You guys get to sit down. And like, go. So, yeah, have a seat wherever you want. And then the one, um, all right. No, I don't want to sit. I want to walk. I'm going to be, so, I'm doing the Phil Donahue style thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the, the one thing, for the love of God, we're not doing the going down the panel stuff. I, I can't deal with them. Um, so, like, to have a question, you can just shout out and say something. You know what I mean? And not, and if you don't have something, like, you know, there'll be a question and you have something to say for it. So, so. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I know what you meant. Okay. All righty, guys. So this is the illustrious panel conversation. And I'm going to... Um, uh, I'm going to ask one or two questions to start it off, but the real idea is to walk around and to have it be participatory, to have y'all, all y'all, as they say, uh, jump in and uh, participate. So I want to start with maybe a provocative question. Um, so uh, one of the issues with uh, sort of the uh, M Health is the barriers to adoption. And you know, one view which, you know, it's same, similar to genomics, people say, well, it's an educational issue. If only people were trained or the new generation or if, if only there was sort of more training or education, then people would use M Health, and so we really ought to work on the education and training. But the other perspective is actually um, businesses, physicians, pharma companies have a pretty, arguably, have a great sense of what actually works, and when something really delivers impact, for example, NIPT testing for genomics, that's adopted faster than anyone can imagine. So the real question is, is there truly the barrier education in that we haven't convinced the stakeholders, or is it that the products really aren't delivering a lot of value, uh, and, and that's what needs to be improved? And we're not going down the aisle. So anyone who has a strong opinion, shout it out, and then we can get to the audience opinions or future questions. All right, we're on. Okay. Um, it's on. I think there are several things. One is, uh, Getting, I, I do think education still is an issue because I think medicine by nature tends to be conservative and adoption of new technologies tends to be slow because, and justifiably so, there is some level of, well, show me, show me, show me. And uh, right now, I think the data often doesn't come back in a useful format, so it is hard to show people. So I think that is a factor, getting data in a digestible format that folks can use. So getting it into the workflow. Yeah, basically, so that people can can realize it. And then there's no question, though, that if we do show studies that this data, that these data are better and are useful in certain contexts with outcomes, that people will then adopt it. And that does take time. Other views, other issues. Is it education versus utility? I think it, one of the things I think about is that it's just time. So it might be time to educate yourself. 17 years thing about a... <laughs> <laughs> which apparently isn't actually accurate, but it's still a good number. <laughs> um, and I think it's that people have numerous things they have to do and focus on. How can they focus on this one additional thing? So we have to make it easier to do for them, the people who need to use it, not just the consumers. What's your experience, Cedric, really being right on the, on the sort of the cutting edge of both developing, really, as you described, being on both sides of it? I mean, speaking uh, about adoption, so if we take the, the other side of, you know, end users, and I, I heard earlier the term uh, quantified self um, So back at the time, you know, we were, we were uh, dealing with very enthusiastic people, people who in terms of, uh, of uh, adopt acceptability will, were willing to adopt any, uh, you know, very weird routine to quantify something because we were dealing with people passionate about uh, tracking and controlling, uh, you know, now a stream of data that, that were tracked. So uh, the paradox is that uh, we have to go be much beyond, you know, quantified safer geeks, you know, fitness enthusiasts, uh, to go uh, beyond the paradox of these solutions will be more useful for people who do not, are not willing to change much of their daily lives or are not willing to uh, wear something that will uh, need to be recharged every night or, you know, are not, not willing to do all this change. So I do think that the user experience and the immediate usability and utility 
uh, does matter a lot and is not fully uh, tackled yet to go uh, to a much larger and general population. Yeah, uh, okay, so an another issue related to wearability, maybe for use bureaus, is the issue of clinical grade and what is the, the level of data quality. Um, people have been using some measure of you know, sensors in clinical studies, you know, FDA, registrational clinical studies, for, for many years. But the general view is people are pretty reluctant to use a lot of the technologies that we were discussing today, um, often because they're not perceived and maybe accurately uh, or appropriately as not validated as being, quote, clinical grade. Um, does, do you think that's a big factor in uh, limiting the use in, in your sector? Well, it, to have something I mean. validated from a regulatory perspective and create precedent, it's very, it's very difficult. Even to validate a tool for clinical trials is a long cascade. So if you look back at the biomarker space, which has a lot of parallels if we're talking about digital biomarker, nowadays it's more challenging to validate a biomarker than to develop a drug, and perhaps more expensive, and perhaps with less of a business case or a business model. So. Um, so now you're moving from biomarkers for everything to biomarkers uh, only, a, only as a last resort. So, so I mean, we, we have to be very careful on, on how we position digital and how we position mHealth in, in research. We don't want to carry the burden of biomarkers. Uh, we want to position them as functional measures. And whether they're uh, consumer grade or uh, medical grade, there are uh, research protocols that would benefit tremendously from uh, uh, consumer grade approaches and others that will require medical grade precision. But I wonder if that would speak to one of the questions that was asked during your session where uh, the, the, the questioner asked, if, is there something that could be done in the space to facilitate adoption that if someone were able to essentially uh, validate a biomarker, qualify a biomarker at a level of rigor, would that then make it easier for pharma companies to then or other companies or healthcare centers to more readily adopt it. Could that be something that would lower the barrier of adoption? So for, I, I just want to mention something else which is very important, which is the, the digital or the technological bias. So if you're looking at, at clinical trials, whenever, you never know what will influence uh, an outcome, especially in diseases like uh, that are prone to placebo, the psychiatric space, in the neurodegenerative space. Uh, so introducing, introducing additional, reminding patients that are in a trial every day, every day having to charge their wearables, having to um, uh, connect to their, to their apps and uh, actively uh, uh, remind, be reminded about the trial may, may actually change the outcomes. No one knows. And, and what's the promise? The promise is to explore something. So I imagine the balance, exploring, versus influencing and spending millions and millions of dollars um, uh, in the process. So it has to be more, more, as you said, more robust, more robust. This, I, so I also use early. But I also appreciate the frustration. I don't know, I know John, is John Hickson here today? Um, so one of the things, he's, he's uh, sort of does clinical trials of digital health and is an epileptologist. And I know how struck he's been by the difficulty of getting pharma companies to use contemporary appropriate measures of epilepsy, for example, in registration of clinical trials, simply because, you probably know this as well as anybody, right? Because everybody, everyone has validated previous drugs based on these existing, if antiquated, standards, and no one wants to necessarily risk changing the, uh, changing the, moving the goalpost. Exactly, so that's the regulatory precedent versus a scientific precedent versus cost versus bias versus risk. So you... Right. Well, I have a couple more questions, but uh, anyone... Shoot. Uh, just a quick question from uh, developing... This is Mundar Barra from Pfizer. I had a club called New Clinical Paradigm. Just from, like, uh, validating a new standard, we do it all the time. In the neuroscience, we just done one last year. We've used the Apple Health Kit as well. We validated the system. And I'm actually surprised to the $4 million that you spoke about, the cost, because we've done some of this in a much, much cheaper way. Uh, just utilizing existing standards, existing groups. So I was a little bit uh, shocked. Wait until you see what our thing does. 
I can show you what our thing does as well. <laughs> it's it's Take not, out your it's thing. not really, thing is bigger than I'm sorry, yours. <laughs> but it's it's okay. But it's uh, it's not about that. Uh, the reason why really I bring this up, I, I just don't want to discourage others because there is uh, we've done actually phase two studies. We've done sensors as well. Uh, and, and the studies, because it sounds like the way you guys are talking, like we're never gonna get there, we're not doing anything. In reality, we utilized the Apple Health Kit, we validated it, we used it in a phase two study. We're using sensors, not in the exploratory data points, we use them for secondary uh, uh, data points as well as expanding labels of drugs. So I just don't wanna give a gloomy uh, point of view. Of I love it, I love yeah. it. You're doing yeah. the right thing, by the yeah. way. I mean, I Thanks. think along these lines, I don't think these are like traditional biomarkers, like molecular biomarkers, which are very expensive and require <laughs> large subjects and you know, yeah. collecting the materials and things is incredibly expensive. Yeah. A lot of these things, it depends on the application, obviously, we're talking about here, yeah. but a lot of these things are simple to collect, and, and yeah. I don't think it has the same barrier that, it, again, it's going to depend on the application, the space, and the yeah. kinds of measurements, but I don't think the bar is like a molecular biomarker. I think this can move yeah. much quicker we into the mainstream. We're even doing stuff with the lubus as well, because as you know, there's no really uh, standards, golden standards for assessment. So we're running a methodology study to, uh, against two different standards, basically, with uh, lubus research as, as well. So just like, and we're planning to donate this back to the Apple Research Kit open platform so we can reuse it across the whole industry. That's, that's really what we're after. That's so. very encouraging. Thank you. Sorry, me again. So uh, we've been kind of beating around the bush a little bit today around does this stuff have ROI, where does it have ROI, what are the friction points, but I'm wondering if each person on the panel can give a very specific example of where you have found ROI in bringing this data in that's sort of problem specific. Um, for example, I've heard... Do you have an example from your own work? Yeah, yeah, I'll try to make it easier question. Um, for example, most recently we've been working with a cardiology clinic that wants to expand out their panel um, per cardiologist, and the way they're doing that is they're trying to keep patients out of the office, they don't need to come into the office, so they can fill those slots with new patients targeted to increase panel sizes by 10% over the next six months. So something sort of specific like that where you've seen real value in bringing in this data. I think Lara's in the best position to comment on this. How's that for passing? Very chivalrous. That's good. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I think we do have some data around hypertension and being able to control blood pressures, and that's directly from device data coming into the EMR. And that's sort of the way that we've configured that. We have a couple other scenarios that we're trying out right now. So one of the ones um, we didn't talk about today is we have a program that we call Connected Mom. It's for uh, pregnant mothers, and we, can, we send them home with a kit that has a scale, a blood pressure cuff, and um, three urine dipstick tests, so they can actually avoid coming into the office. You know, you normally have 14, 13 or 14 visits. I think it's supposed to be 13 for a normal healthy pregnancy. If we sign you up for this, you can only come in for 11 of those. You don't have to come in for all of them. So I think that's an, that's an ROI that is for the patient, certainly, but we can also tie that ROI to two free slots on any of those OBGYN schedules. Um, which has another value that we associate with that as well. So that one's still early, but I think that's some of the things we're thinking about. I mean, I think you can model this stuff out too, but I don't know how accurate it'll be. It's early, for us, it's early days, so I don't know other than in anecdotal things what to say about that. But if you think about the space you're in, like in our case, we're very interested now in this infectious disease space, and in the U.S., that's a, I don't know what it is, $6 billion a year industry or something. You can model out that if you save, you know, 50% by telling your kids to stay at home because their heart rate's been too high, well, then you've saved potentially $3 billion of spreading, or actually it's probably more than that because it's an exponential thing. So you can model these things out, but actually showing a reality, I think, does need to be done. <clears throat> you said it is that a line with what you're thinking? Uh, yeah, and, and in the line of uh, hypertension management, we did publish some some studies uh, with uh, AMGA on the rate of uh, of the control rate of hypertension uh, in a study where you know you you use connected blood pressure monitor and and type of uh, communication with caregivers using a, co a continuous stream of information compared to non uh, non non use of this device, and and we clear uh, we showed a, a rate of going from forty percent to 
to 75% control rate after six months, so very similar to what, uh, what's being experienced. So there are, there are some cases where you know, we, do, we do have a very clear, measurable, and quantifiable uh, outcomes. Let me ask a couple of quest related questions, more related to uh, data volume, to the large volume. I think, uh, Michael, in, um, your, uh, in your slide, you talked about one person, billion, billions, billions and billions of data points, right? So two issues, one came up during one of the talks, um, which is, do we even have any sense of what's normal and what's not when dealing with those, those amounts of data? When we move from episodic to continuous care, do we know how to interpret that? And, uh, and how do we get to where, <laughs> you know, obviously we don't for the most part, but how do we, how yeah. do we get to a better place? No, it's place? a great question. So for what it's worth, I think, I you think suggested I have about it. a half a petabyte or a petabyte of data just on me. Uh, and on our cohort of 100 people, it's, I'm not sure what it is. It's pretty big. Uh, but what we are doing, and it is a research study, we are defining people. First of all, we're trying to figure out what is baseline health measurements for people when you have these longitudinal samples. You can really define that quite accurately. And then, again, then the goal is to find deviations from that. So I think we know what kinds of molecules are very stable and, you know, some very key molecules like cytokines and things which are involved in your immune response. Uh, and then likewise for the physiological parameters. So uh, I, I do think it's there. Now, to be useful in a clinical standpoint, we need to automatically extract that and then have automatic algorithms, which is what we are developing to be able to find those times when you do see those deviations from your baseline. That is the ultimate goal. But we're not there yet because ours is a research study, but I hope from the wearable side, that's one we're actively working on to try and make an app that will tell you when your heart rate's been up too high so that you have a sense when you are getting sick. Yeah, and, and uh, to add to the complexity, there are some, uh, there, there is human function quantification that is a lot more complex than, than heart rate, unfortunately, which is, uh, for instance, how do you quantify uh, abnormal involuntary movement? For instance, there is something that's called chorea in neurology, which is dance-like chaotic movement. And, and to do so, you have to uh, clearly separate it for what, from what's, what's normal. And how do you separate normal dance moves from an abnormal uh, Korea uh, move? So I'm just exaggerating here, but the same applies for tremor, the same applies for a lot of the human quantification variables outside of vitals, and which adds tremendously to the complexity. So the question is, are we really measuring what we are supposed to be measuring? Just, just a, a little bit back on that. I just want to make sure that we, I guess, as you were saying earlier, that we have a, just the right level of hope here. So when we drop a little bit below that, I want to raise it a little <laughs> bit. Um, for I would have thought that from some movement disorders, that's one of the areas where there has been, it seems to me, a lot of work. When I talk to my coll the colleagues, you know, folks I know at Biogen, they seem to have, well, they have their own sensor that they've developed that they're using um, for some patients. When I talked to, when I wrote about last week about the um, Ver uh, Verily study watch, a key part of that was sort of measuring, uh, measuring movements. Other, other folks are working on that. You know, particularly for areas like Parkinson's, say, are you heartened to any degree by some of the results of all of these wearable and device makers trying to capture this particularly elusive phenotype? And the answer is yes. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, well, I have to disclose that I'm chairing the technology task force for the Movement Disorder Society. So I'm not only involved and optimistic, uh, but I've seen tremendous progress over the last five years. I'm, I'm, I, I'm talking to an educated audience, and it's better to talk about the challenges than um, the potential. I think I did a lot of that uh, during 10 minutes. There is a lot of, there is a lot of um, hope, and I can tell you people can quantify, for instance, motor fluctuations in Parkinson's disease. They can quantify tremor. Uh, they can quantify the degrees of cognitive impairment uh, in, in dementias. Uh, in, in the space of, they can quantify behavioral aberrations in psychiatric diseases using um, the collective power of, of a cell phone uh, and its sensors. So there is a lot that has been achieved, a lot, a tremendous amount of, 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 uh, of promise. The danger lies when you're overselling the promise, and we're seeing a lot of this nowadays. I've heard it can be a problem. Yeah. Um, and then... 
Go ahead. Oh, can I add one thing? I think the other thing um, that we haven't really talked a lot about is patient reported outcomes because we also have the opportunity through apps and smartphones to capture patient reported outcomes and engage them in their health that way, not just through devices. There's a ton of data that we can collect there, trying to look at that and what that means. I, I also don't know what that means. Um, for what's normal, how happy should someone be on a daily basis? I don't know. And, and speaking, you know, thinking about it from the regulatory perspective, the FDA had a very significant initiative specifically trying to capture patient reported outcomes and recognizing that that was a huge and underreported parameter that they really wanted to uh, more systematically incorporate in their understanding of illnesses. I wanted to get to you, but I see you waiting, so go ahead. Yes, I, I kind of have. Um I can chime in on sort of the patient outcomes. And, and I almost think that, that the sort of Silicon Valley mentality has sort of overtaken common sense. No. Um, as physicians, <laughs> we all know patients report all kinds of stuff that are of little to no consequence to, their, to sort of their final course. Shouldn't we almost be focusing on the, on the medical professionals <clears throat> that would label Korea versus a dance-like movement quite accurately versus a patient, right? I mean. It sort of comes back to this outcomes. How do we avoid, um, like let's look at cancer. All this data, all this imaging data has largely been finding inconsequential incidentalomas. Like how do we avoid that problem, sort of the specificity argument of outcomes without going after the healthcare providers? Maybe um, I'll go, I think that it's probably dependent upon which disease states you're looking at or which chronic diseases. So I don't think patient reported outcomes will help in a lot of areas, but it might in some. Um, for example, we look at like post-op surgery. If you have a hip replacement or a knee replacement, we definitely want your patient reported outcomes on your mobility and how you evaluate that. Versus you're right, if it's something um, that's cancer treatment, we probably wanna go more focused with the providers and talk to them about what works for them. So I. I think the way that we think about it is really approaching it from each chronic disease or each condition or each thing separately. It's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. It's not going to be a mobile device for every chronic disease, um, but it's, it's a different solution. But I can also imagine some might view aspects of that question as sort of having a kind of the, almost a traditional patina of paternalism where, you know, physicians are, you know, with their training, with their expertise, aren't, you know, and, you know, maybe in some ways appropriate, maybe in some ways not, aren't they most, most suited to opine? And I guess I think about some of the examples from Bill Crowley as, as sort of a trans, clinical trans, you know, invest, you know, you know, myself, well, you know, from Mass General, where he would talk about there were so many con endocrine conditions that he was among the first to describe, and he would say before he wrote them up, you know, in the New England Journal, no one reported any of them, and then all of a sudden they would be here was a paper validating it, and suddenly all of a sudden then physicians would start to ask. So the question is, aren't there other conditions? Aren't there other nuances and subtleties and aspects of the lived experience? that um, I think you're right that there are complexities of how fa uh, doctors doctor that technologists are blowing and that they're, they're trying to sort of summarize and not capture well. But I also continue to believe that there are important elements that as good as physicians are, they're not quite capturing and you don't know that they're not and there might really be opportunities in richer data capture to um, uh, surface some of these um, conditions. Well, the main reason I ask is because in the AI world, everything is supervised. Like the most impact for all the prediction is all supervised learning. Yet sort of the sensor world, it's sort of unsupervised. Let's just collect everything with no real scientific question. Like what are we going to do with this? <laughs> right. Uh, you know? Yeah, no, I, a small comment around this. And one of the major challenges that I found over the years talking about this uh, topic is le lexicon. So the language that we speak is not, is not a common one, and that, that prevents us from communicating and talking about the same thing. So, you know, for instance, today we're here talking about mHealth, but I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, and at times I'm confused, is it sensors that we're talking or mHealth? Because sensors are just a part of mHealth. mHealth is uh, smart packaging, is gamification, is telemedicine, is a lot of things that have nothing to do with sensors. And holistically, this provides a tremendous amount of opportunity, but yet again, we are somewhat obsessed with sensors. I, I mean, I, I honestly believe that image and image analysis is the next frontier for quantification of human function. I think it's because it's a wearables conference. <laughs> but this is an mHealth panel. So I think, 
I just wanted to add my voice to the fact that patient patient-generated or person-generated data is invaluable in this sphere, and that we now have a way to triangulate that with images, sensors, and everything else, because you as a doctor will never know if I have a stomach ache, unless you ask me. And, 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 and uh, certainly in the study of lupus, where's the lupus person? Lupus person, where are you? The one that just talked. Hi. That, you can't do that without patient-reported or person reported outcomes. And I think the idea that sensing is gonna solve everything I, is I don't think true. And I think that we have gone kind of crazy with sensing. I did, I am completely, I'm just so excited about it. I was, you know, and imaging, ooh, so exciting. But in the end, it all ties together with the lived experience. And if you ignore that, and the new ways that we can get at that, I think it's a huge mistake. So just while you're still there, Keep you there for a moment. Do you feel like you've went through this period where you've kind of you've kind of explored and experienced a lot of these different approaches and have sort of coned it down to uh, sort of a smaller number of approaches that are more effective? I don't think I've honed. <laughs> I have, I'm unhoned. Okay. I, I feel um, that that is also depends on. Um, I, there was a time as a psychologist that I was thinking, oh, we can sense everything. Ubiquitous is the way to go. I don't believe that anymore. I mean, if I believe that as a psychologist, right. you can imagine. I don't believe that anymore. I think that uh, from what I've seen and the work that I've done, um, the, the hugest value is in the, in the triangulation. We've got to think outside the tesseract. Okay. Hi, my name is Jeff Cross. I'm a physician at the VA here in Palo Alto, and then I also I'm a medical advisor for a Midiar network, um, Pierre Midiar's investment firm doing digital health advising for them. And uh, one of the questions that I keep struggling with is what, what we're going to do with all this data that's coming in from the different sources in the sort of EMR-centric world. And I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on where is this central kinds of repositories going to be in the future? Is it the self-generated data and the going into the EMR and the genomic data going into the EMR and all of the omic, you know, multi-omic stack going into the EMR? Or do we need or, or can you imagine sort of new paradigms that are sort of um, aggregating all of this information and, and making it available both on the personal level and at an aggregate research level? I do think that we will not continue in an EMR-centric world. Um, but that said, I, until physicians operate out of an EMR-centric world, um, EMRs are still going to be very central to us. So I really, you know, part of what I was talking about is the quadruple aim, making things easier for physicians. We have to make their workflow as easy as possible. If the way to do that right now, the best way that we know how is to include things in the EMR when appropriate, I think that's right. Do I think we'll ever add all the genomic data into the EMR? I do not. I think we will add pieces and parts when it's relevant to what they need to be doing, but we'll have people that continue to work outside of that, um, and we'll have to figure out some sort of integration and combination on how we, we do all of those things together. I can tell you right now, we do... Um, all of the data that we get from sensors um, comes into our EMR, and that's the hub that we're using for that. And we use HealthKit, and um, we're, we use some other integrations direct um, with Withings and things like that to get data into the EMR. Michael. Yeah, I mean, I would second that. And, and as someone who does a lot with genomic data, it, and I'm involved in seeing these reports, it's, it's usually just the relevant variants that will come back and go into the ER. But... The data itself is somewhere. It's kept in a, a different place, so it. people do need to go explore it uh, and look for something they can get at it. So I think there's an active part that's very in front for the physician that they can look at very quickly. And my own view is that that will be the way the wearable space works too, that you could dive deeper if you need to look at specific patterns in more detail. but. The summaries will show up front and center for physicians, at least that's how I would envision it. It's got to be very simple, like your car dashboard, just something where you get a quick summary so that people can get the relevant but, information quickly. It, it sounds like a, a sort of an interesting question on two different, uh, a question on two different levels. On one hand, um, there's value, what you're, what you're getting is obviously the immediately actionable data you want to have present for the physician so that he or she can see it and do something with it. But there's also a recognition that what your perception of what's valuable in rich data may change over time. And 
in, in many places at least want the ability to uh, reinterrogate it as more knowledge, what, you know, our knowledge of variants changes in genetics, maybe with the knowledge that we can get out of heart patterns. Maybe you look at some reading now from, you know, that, that, that a Y things device is producing, that we can get some measure of value now, but with future insight, we'll be able to make greater conclusions or we might want the, the opportunity to do that. I think can, the second- Can I, can I add one thing? Yeah. On? I, mean, I mean, I think where we're at now, which I really like is that we can collect longitudinal data at a level that's never been possible before. And to me, that's the power of all this. So you can really define, again, these healthy baselines. And it also lets us look at interrogate health at a level that's never been looked at before. Absolutely. Of, it comes back to your original slide, which is getting from reactive to anticipatory or, right. or even before that. So I, I think that's the key. It's really to collect these longitudinal data sets that can really define health at a level that just hasn't been possible. I mean, clearly there are a number that's of... that's what's attractive about M Health is that you can get a lot of it. And it goes back to the earlier comment, which is why is there so much emphasis on sensor? Well, it's because you can collect this continuous data. And as soon as it's not continuous, mm -hmm. it winds up getting thrown into a drawer. You know, people use it for amusement for three months and then it disappears. And I think that's why people like sensors because it's easy, right? You wait, I, look, I got three of these things. It's trivial to wear these things. Right. Tons of data come in. I don't mm. think about it. The only time I think about it is when I'm charging them up. So the more we have it as an automatic background, the easier it is to adopt, I think. Uh, and I, I just wanted to add one other comment. In addition yes. to the question of sort of the limited data versus more expensive, expansive, and expensive probably, also the idea of the location of the data, whether the rich data will be sitting at a hospital or whether you'll, you'll sort of own it, you know, or at least have access to it the way you have, you know, to your iTunes or something like that. And I'm, I guess I'm continuing to be maybe uniquely intrigued by the concept that I guess the second head of ONC, David Blumenthal, talked about last year in the Wall Street Journal, where he talked about the concept of health data stewards, where basically kind of almost this intermediate industry that will evolve to help people manage all of their data, both to extract it out of EMRs, which we all know is brutal, plus to be able to help manage other data that you have, so that everyone, in a sense, would have an account of their own data managed by this particular new role, which is just what the health system needs. I know another role. Go. I just want to go back to Laura's point, which I agree 100% uh, with, uh, and I think the way it's trending right now in the next two to three, two to five years, is the blockchain technology. Right, so it enables patient centricity. So you own your data, you'll be able to capture all your data and somehow through the grassroots it will be stored somewhere in the internet securely with full transparency or the trail, the nine yards, but also gives a good view, holistic view of the patient, wherever which doctor you went into, whether it's in this uh, state or another state, whether this physician has an EMR system or not, potentially all these, uh, and central labs, et cetera, et cetera, your own sensors, all this can be aggregated by you and controlled by you. And then it enables the whole network of data donation. So at this point, you could, because you, you have control over your data, you could say, I would like to donate my data for this research, for this clinical trial, and you control for the length and what data that, rather than either this or nothing, or everything or nothing, you can control it through the blockchain. So I think that's where we're trending in that direction. I wish that uh, John Madison was here to opine on this. I know he would love to. <laughs> Does uh, anyone want to uh, specifically address blockchain? Comment will stand. It's, it's a great comment. Go ahead. I had a question, uh, again, back to the semantics and, and the lexicon of using the word health here. So, so I do believe that um, once you have signs and symptoms of disease, that sensors that are continuously monitoring that already know your baseline health can detect when disease has onset, and you can perhaps use that for feedback or early detection. But isn't the real power of this potential of, of wearable sensors for um, learning what your risks are for disease in, in the future because it's, well, could be much easier to intervene or, or you might actually have some knobs that you can twist. Um, are there many examples that you know of where there's some promise that we might be able to, you know, years in front of a disease uh, have wearables help uh, with, with predicted risk? Would an example be uh, like loss of heart rate variability as predicting sort of worsening condition, that sort of thing, but I guess more years in advance? Yeah, so the, the example, so I, I think uh, that's really where 
so we have strong hope of, of delivering value is how we you know help prevention and very early detection and you know bringing out pulse wave velocity just you know generate, generate on one hand a lot of challenge again because I think we discussed this already is that there is no equivalent there is no today existing uh, on that scale database of pulse wave velocity measurement acro across you know healthy less healthy people we think that a you know it will again help to generate some baseline but also on the individual or longitudinal longitudinal you know monitoring uh, it will you know, help to trigger some, you know, hopefully orange flag and not red flags, and uh, whether it will spot on, you know, arterial, you know, stiffness or, you know, some change on your cardiovascular system. So that's really where, and actually we invite, you know, the scientific community to work also with us, because today we do measure and display pulse wave velocity, but as many of you know that uh, today it's, it's correlated with other conditions. We cannot do such claim, you know, on the consumer uh, level, but we do believe there's a lot of insight uh, to generate some, you know, preventive, you know, statements uh, on your health. And again, we invite here people to come to us and, and, uh, and see how we can collaborate. And I think what you're describing also describes the motivation for both some aspects of the prospective cohort study that all, all of us and also some other sort of baseline efforts that um, have, or, you know, will, will be underway in the community. So I'd like to make a couple, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, and then ask a question. So I have one of these. Uh, I guess everyone in this room has one of these. It's actually quite bulky relative to a sensor. Um, and I have to charge it all the time, every, at least once a day. Um, so I don't think the issue of the device or the need to charge it is at the issue. Why do I carry this around? Because it delivers value. Right? And I think that we've got to change the equation from the push of the technology to the pull of the value that it's going to deliver. And I think that looking at, at the question that every physician asks every patient who comes in through the office door, and that is, so how have you been since the last time I saw you? That's a terrible data gathering uh, opportunity. Um, so I think that what we've got to do, I agree that there's hours and hours and hours and hours of lost data uh, that could be applied to that question in a rational way that could actually be used in a very similar way to Auctioner is using it and other systems to answer that question in a way that provides accuracy to some degree, and is some way related to the quality of care or the impact on the patient. When we, uh, just to speak to the question that was asked last time, um, when we uh, survey our network of 4,000 people with MS and we create a word cloud of their answers, the number one uh, word is prognosis. What's going to happen to me? And so I think somewhere between what's going to happen to me and so how have you been since the last time I saw you is where we should be focusing this because if you know what, you're trying, what value you're trying to deliver, then it'll make everything that's happening. So how do you think we're going to get to the point where both sides of that conversation um, see the value in the introduction of mobile technologies. So, Jack, I actually want to give that to you. It's a difficult question as it is because I feel like in, in some sense you've thought um, or maybe have made the most specific progress on the device end towards thinking about how to make something explicitly useful. Uh, yes, but first, you know, I, I don't think I, I agree with uh, you know this your statement on the the value or immediate value and usability and and the fact that we we can accept uh, you know any kind of uh, experience and the comparison you give um, you know if you were to to be offered to wear some, something because it will trigger you have some condition and it will uh, give you an early sign of uh, of a heart failure or or a stroke there is some immediate value. And, and there is, you know, a much higher, uh, I think, level of acceptance. 
uh, versus when you are wearing something to, to answer the very question uh, you, you mentioned from your doctor, on the long term, gather some information, bits of, of information that will not turn into an action you know, real time at a specific moment, but still will need, I mean, will make you feel like you are wearing sensors and will call from some, some action like recharging. I do think it's, uh, it does, uh, you know, it, we do have to solve this issue uh, because there, I do think that the value and the, and the, uh, uh, of, uh, of the use for, in a lot of cases, will be generated by the long term use of it, not only because and how to generate this baseline, but because it will answer or help inform the doctor on episodes moments uh, with the data that is accumulated but frankly that is on the short period of time that have very low value having two hours of your level of activity has no value and and no immediate value for yourself except on specific case I mentioned Maybe a last audience question and if there's time I have one other quick question go ahead okay uh, Mike Swernick from Kaiser uh, we've been doing a bit of work in this space and one of the very practical challenges that we have is around patient privacy and particularly when it comes to HIPAA and in the wearable space in particular. Um, and so for those who have the, don't have to deal with HIPAA very much, if a patient brings in, say, their, their weight uh, app uh, tool and they show it to me, great, that's not a problem. But as soon as I as a clinician say, hey, why don't you go use this weight app and send me the data back through my EHR, that's arguably covered under HIPAA, and uh, it's typically done through a vendor who uh, wants to resell that patient data for some other purpose or use it for something. Um, and so I, I'm just curious how you guys have tackled this or how you think we should tackle it. And it's not in, for us certainly, it's not inconsequential. We spent over a year getting a contract with one vendor last year on this particular issue. It just went round and round of we need you to be covered under HIPAA and you can't market to our patients. And they said, oh, but we want to market to your patients because there are patients too, so. <laughs> anyway. I have a very short answer for uh, clinical research and trial pur purposes. It's uh, the informed consent. I think um, the, the way that we have thought about this is to do what you described, which is can have the patient's consent in advance of sending any data to us. So that, that's the way we do it. So to enroll in any programs that we have, you the physician actually places an order. That order uh, triggers the patient online to fill out consent forms, essentially, and now they can send us the data. We don't accept the data until they've done that. I will say it's terrific when it works out. I, I um, met one medical, and they are able to use actually all my Wythings data, which get directly, to, um, you know, I show up in the office, and they have all of it, and it's, it, it makes for, you know, a more, more informative conversation. Last question, and then um, I think we'll thank, we'll thank the panel, is um, it came up briefly in, in one, of the, one of the comments, I think, that you had made. Um, one of both the, the, the uh, segment of the population uh, that is arguably both the most likely and least likely to benefit from some of these approaches are older people. How do you, in terms of whether clinical studies, in terms of clinical care, in terms of what you're designing and what your own experience is um, when you've thought about this have been, do you, where, where do you see older people fitting in the uh, M Health environment? I think older people have proven that they are interested and engaged and want to be involved in their care. Um, I think, you know, I, I don't have the studies off the top of my head, but I know there have been several um, cited where patients, regardless of their age, really want to engage in their care and want to be an active member of the care team. Um, so I think we can use that to our advantage to engage them through ML too. Do you think there's an opportunity, um, Spiros, for, um, to, rec to, for, uh, to get for uh, older folks in uh, clinical studies using M Health, absolutely. Um, virtual um, and remote uh, data collection is uh, one of uh, the key initiatives in the clinical trial world uh, today, and there are many chronic diseases that affect um, older individuals, and our strategies. Uh, cut across uh, ages. They're not limited to, uh, to younger individuals. And then, Cedric, for, uh, for older folks, did you find in terms of the interest in, in, in the Wythings products, did you, uh, how did that vary with age? 
uh, sorry, what, what is the average? interest, the, the, uh, the traction that the, that the products you were selling enjoyed was, on one hand, there's this stereotype that older people might be less technically savvy. On the other hand, there's some data that says, as you were pointing out, that's actually a stereotype and it's not true. And then in addition, there's arguably the segment of the population where the medical need would be predicted to be the greatest. So I'm wondering what your actual sales data were on older folks versus less older folks. So, so sales data might be different from user data. So okay. uh, and, and active use. No, then. so and typically yeah. uh, uh, we've seen a, a lot of traction of, of people you know, gearing up or equip, equipping their older parents. Uh, and typically for a blood pressure monitor. And, and we really saw this, uh, uh, this very specific demand and we shaped some of our feature uh, huh. for user demanding you know, the, you know, a very use case to uh, equip an older parents and get, uh, get the measurement and be able you know, to uh, uh, entertain a, a communication and, and um, being empowered as a caregiver as all the elderly, uh, elderly person. So that's a very strong driver uh, for us that we've, again, we input in our you know, features and roadmaps. Right. And then all I have for you, Michael, is I guess you're a clear demonstration that if you wear, that if you utilize enough wearables, you wind up looking young forever, right? <laughs> You'll wind up what? Looking young forever. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> all right, thank you, guys. Joy, do you want people to be in their seats when they do it or come up or? They're supposed to come up right come before up. their Good. talk. So thank you to David for moderating and to all our speakers, I think, for a very interesting uh, discussion. So thank you all again. Um, we're going to switch gears now and share with you some of the other research that's going on in the wearable space. We have um, posters and exhibits and welcome you to join us afterwards and you'll get a preview of some of those right now. So first off is Ernesto from Fitabase. I've got one minute. So who here has a Fitbit or has used one? Who here has used a Fitbit in a research study or has thought about it or in a healthcare setting? Great. So if you'd like to do that, Fitabase is the leading data management provider and platform for wearable devices. Primarily, we focus right now on Fitbit. We've also launched a new integration with BodyTrace, which is a cellular connected body weight scale. Super great. Um, and we're also looking at doing some more integrations. I'm looking at you, Cedric. Um, so we'd love to talk. I'm going to be over there. Uh, I've got lots of stuff I can show you, lots of data I can show you. I can show you my own data if you want. So come on over and say hello. Hi everyone, my name is Tim Altov and uh, I'm a PhD candidate in the computer science department at Stanford. I'm also a uh, part of uh, the Mobileye Center at Stanford. Uh, my research is, and my background is around data science and my research addresses how to uh, use um, online social networks uh, to improve, to help improve human health. And today I'm presenting a new study on uh, how online social networks affect our exercise and our physical activity. So the question is when you connect to your family and friends on Fitbit or whatever device or app you're using now, does it actually make any difference? Is there actually a causal effect of when you see other people's behavior, is that actually changing your behavior? Um, we uh, did a study on uh, about six million people and roughly one trillion uh, steps. Um, come by the poster if you wanna hear the answer what, what's actually happening. Uh, come by if you're interested in how these effects might vary across different, different kinds of people. Uh, we've also done um, some work on how competitions and other forms of gamification or Pokemon Go impact your um, activity. Uh, so please come by and, uh, if you're interested. Thank you. So I'm Jim Ray from Georgia Tech. I'm the deputy director of the MD2K Center. So we're building an open source, freely available platform for collecting high frequency mobile sensor data 
And we have two main areas of focus. The first is real-time analytics. So we're addressing the scalability issues in detecting health behaviors in the field, predicting states of risk fast enough to close the loop and deliver a mobile intervention uh, in, the, in the field environment. The second focus is on raw sensor data. We believe very strongly in the need to collect and store, ultimately share raw data to support validation and drive the ecosystem of open, open health research. Um, so please come on my poster and talk about these issues and others, and I'll show you what we're doing. Thanks. Everybody, uh, my name is Matteo. I'm from Empatica. We we build medical devices that look like uh, consumer wearables, and uh, the one that we are showing here is our latest product. It's called Embrace, and um, it is a medical device in Europe. It's still under um, FDA um, approval in um, in the U.S. and it's primary application today is for uh, real-time seizure detection. So it's a um, life-saving application for issuing alerts of people that suffer from from this chronic disease. And uh, we do a lot of research with leading pharmaceutical companies, all the top hospitals and um, universities in the world on uh, many other applications, in uh, neurology mostly, but uh, other fields. So if you want to know more, uh, you're welcome to join at the poster area. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessie Lynn Dunn. I'm a, I'm a mobilized postdoctoral fellow. Um, I work in Mike Snyder's lab um, and with Scott Delp as well. Um, and so Mike gave a pretty good overview of sort of the work that we're doing here with uh, consumer wearable devices and how we can use the data for health-related purposes. Um, on my poster, I'll elaborate a bit more on this illness detection that Mike mentioned um, the Lyme disease case as well as some other cases. Um, so do come by my poster and get a bit more detail. Thanks. Hi, I'm CK, uh, representing Max Nader Lab for uh, Rehab Technologies and Outcomes Research at uh, Shirley Lyon Ability Lab, uh, formerly known as uh, Rehab Institute of Chicago. Uh, here in Chicago, we are uh, dedicated in using wearable sensors uh, exclusively for tracking patients' uh, progress during recovery, and also uh, we wanted to see in some cases when they use some sort of uh, assistive devices or new technologies, we wanted to see how they are performing in the community. So. We want to do some real-time community monitoring or mobility monitoring in the community. And of course, there are a lot of sensors that are quite well be able to do that. But when it comes to the disabled population, um, like stroke, spinal cord injury, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, namely anything, uh, they are very different from healthy people like you and I. Uh, they have a lot of uh, issues with their own movement signatures. Um, so that's where we come in creating custom algorithms that we could do this. And um, to know more, stop by my poster at Exhibit 8. Thank you. I'm Monisha Prakash, CEO and co-founder of Lumo Body Tech. We are a motion science platform uh, that focuses on biomechanics and movement quality. We've commercialized our technology through a couple of products. Uh, one is our Lumo Lift Posture Coach. I'm wearing it right now. It's this little uh, square magnet. When you slouch, it vibrates to remind you to straighten up. Um, we also have a running sensor. It, it serves as a real-time running coach that gives you feedback on your running form so that you can not only run faster and farther, but also prevent injury. And we're working on future applications of our motion science platform 
for movement disorders and uh, fall prevention, fall detection, as well as physical therapy. So um, if any of that is of interest to you, please stop by our booth. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Mernier from Evidation Health. Um, we have a connected population of patients, a dynamic technology platform that enables us to run studies um, and pretty sophisticated machine learning and analytics capabilities um, that are generating data on health outcomes for patients. Um, so we're sort of taking this Easter egg of all the different kinds of data types that we've talked about today, um, connecting them through a platform that was custom designed um, to run studies so um, we can spin up studies very easily um, and connect both the data types in gray as well as the data types in blue to sort of bring together disparate data um, to gain a better understanding of lived experience with disease or digital health interventions. Um, we also have a connected population um, of millions of people who we can tap into to recruit into these studies. Um, so we've recruited studies up to 95,000 people um, and the longest study has taken five months. The 95,000 one took two weeks though. Um, so I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to chat about um, about uh, observing the lived experience of patients or uh, interventional opportunities. Thanks. Yes. Hi. I'm, I'm only thing standing between you and alcohol. Um, I am Donna Sprout Metz. Um, I am a, I'm, I'm at USC as a professor in preventive medicine and psychology, and I'm presenting this study that we're doing called Monitoring and Modeling of Family Eating Dynamics. And what it really is is, build, is a building a cyber physical system to understand family eating dynamics um, within the family, so socially networked, real time, interactions, reactions in the home. And what I'd like to leave you with is I think that we are all looking often underneath the streetlight for the answers because that's where the light is. And we're asking maybe the same questions again and again when I think with the kind of data that we're getting now, with this kind of streaming data that we're getting at all sorts of levels, we can ask some new questions of that data. I, I, offer, I, I hope that you can help me think outside the Tessar Act. I think we need a transdisciplinary treasure hunt to look at this different kind of data that we're getting. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Gittleman. Ooh. And um, I'm here with my colleague, Lisa Lim, um, on behalf of the Eureka Research Platform. We're an NIH-funded research um, infrastructure initiative. and. Um, we're, we're based out of UCSF. We have a team of cardiologists and developers who are working on perfecting this infrastructure. Um, right now, what we're working on is a web and mobile-based um, research platform in which we can allow investigators to um, easily and efficiently run clinical research remote, remotely, um, all with uh, participants able to take part in studies from the comfort of their own home. Um, another goal that we have is to collect data in a de-identified fashion and then eventually share it in um, a broad way with other investigators in the community. So um, we definitely are looking for collaborations with other investigators, so stop by our table if you have any questions and we'd love to talk to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Oliver Alami. I'm a vascular surgeon, and I treat a lot of what's called peripheral artery disease, and it's a disease, I'll tell you, that's designed for activity tracking and so on, because as you see in the image on the right, you get blockages in the arteries going to the muscles and the legs, and as the disease burden increases, you actually get pain every time you walk at a certain distance, and it happens every time. It doesn't matter if it's sunny or cloudy. Uh, it's very consistent, and as vascular surgeons, we treat a lot of these patients with stents, as you see, and the failure rates are extremely high, and we're, we as clinicians are really bad at tracking these patients and often wait until they come to the ER and they fail. 
Our surveillance protocols aren't great. When they come to the office, we often just ask, well, how are you doing? Are you walking a block, two blocks? And you assume the patient's telling you the truth. So we started the Vast Track uh, study, which is using simply the mobile phone. We're trying to be as passive as possible. Can we track these patients passively and pick up um, how they're doing? And uh, we have a poster describing it more uh, in the hallway next door. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dennis Wall. Autism is at once a public health crisis and an incredible beachhead opportunity to transform the way we understand the applications of wearables and mHealth in brain health in particular, and how we can use technologies like this to both increase the efficacy and reduce the cost. We're doing exactly this in my lab. We've built a machine learning system that works on home videos in minutes to ch change the diagnosis and detection of autism from something that takes hours to something that takes minutes. We've created a machine learning toolkit to augment the way we deliver social therapy, which is critical for kids with autism, in the home settings using augmented reality devices like Google Glasses. And we've created a system through this that enables us to continuously deliver therapeutic intervention while capturing information on which we can operate to transform our models if necessary and to react to changes in the system as it's being used at home. We've developed a system as well using mobile technologies to, um, <laughs> to uh, capture an online active community of participants that represent uh, actively engage parents and participants in our research studies, and we can ask them continuously for information. I can tell you about that in our poster session, and we'll be there at number 16. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lindia. I'm from Dr. David Camrio's lab. And uh, so head impact exposure in contact sports have been shown to be linked with concussions as well as long-term outcomes such as neurodegeneration. So in our lab, we've developed an instrumented mouse guard to measure head impact exposure in contact sports accurately, both in terms of kinematic accuracy as well as counting impacts accurately such that we can start tracking the head impact exposure in these sports. Um, to correlate with any outcomes such as concussions or long-term changes. Um, so if you're interested in this topic and in the device, uh, come by our poster and uh, a little exhibit to learn a little more about how the mouse guard works as well as uh, maybe walk a dummy HUD to see how, much, how hard you need to hit a HUD in order to get a concussion. there. I'm, um, excuse me, I'm a Chief Scientific Officer of Modus Health. We're creators of the Stepwatch Activity Monitor. This is a walking monitor that's unique in its ability to be incredibly accurate in even the most impaired patients. We are an FDA-listed Class II medical device and have traditionally been used in research, um, although we are gaining more clinical use applications. Uh, two years ago, we became reimbursable at the uh, VA hospitals for use in veterans ambulating with a lower limb prosthesis. However, um, for this to expand, we need to become easier to use. So we have a prototype we'll be demoing today that has mobile connectivity and working to develop it to, uh, to transmit to a HIPAA compliant cloud. So uh, we hope you'll come by our exhibit, Exhibit 18. So thank you. Here, I saw him. Um, he stepped out, so I wasn't quite aware. Um. Hi, uh, I'm Natty Coleman. I'm a designer at Microsoft Research, specifically the Healthcare Next division, um, the AI research team. Uh, we're building a suite of tools that uh, are in use by uh, healthcare providers uh, as well as governments. Um, and a number of research institutions. So we're building a suite of tools that are based on the uh, Health Fault system, which is a HIPAA compliant 
uh, Microsoft Azure services, uh, including a machine learning library that basically ingests um, data from a number of different sources, uh, whether or not that's a wearable or clinical grade devices, uh, and it takes that data and spins it up, can spit out insights if that's necessary for a doctor to be able to kind of churn through data, um, as well as uh, building a suite of tools for behavior change for chronic illnesses, um, as well as continuous care through remote monitoring. Um, we're also building uh, a set of tools for uh, using cognitive services for like triage bots uh, and a bunch of other uses uh, for conversational interfaces. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll be demoing some of these scenarios uh, uh, here at our, at our poster. Um, awesome, thanks. So one of the great things about lightning talks is that you can begin to see real applications in a very short period of time. If you can take a diagnosis uh, from hours to minutes, people are going to adopt that just because it's uh, the value proposition is clear. So I wanted to do two things. First, to thank Ida and Joy for a great afternoon. And also to let you know this is the beginning of the scientific discussion about the, the posters that are just across the way here. It's uh, what I call a lubricated poster session because it's an open bar. So uh, th things tend to get a little bit uh, freer after the first half an hour. So I invite everybody to just walk across, enjoy snacks, enjoy drinks, and uh, have great scientific discussion.